डाल दें हेलो Dear guests, welcome back back to afternoon session. Uh, we will start the session with our keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Bülent Süper. Before handing him over the stage, I would like to introduce Dr. Süper to you. Uh, Dr. Bülent Süper studied at law, studied law at Istanbul University Faculty of Law and following his graduation in 1965, became academic assistant in shipping law and air law. He received his PhD degree in 1973. He was admitted to 
İstanbul Bar in 1966. Bülent Sözer taught at Bosphorus University and Koç University, having retired in 2005 from full-time teaching. He joined Yeditepe University and was responsible for the courses on maritime law. Currently, he teaches maritime law in Piraeus University, and he is also the director of university's maritime law research center. Besides having written several books on shipping law and air law, Dr. Sözer also wrote the section on Turkey in the fourth edition of Limitation of Liability for Maritime Claims, London Press 2005. He was also the author of the section of Turkish law in the Maritime Law Handbook published by Kluver, Kluver International and sponsored by International Bar Association. He is currently writing a book on unmanned ships, which was commissioned by the informal Rutledge London, UK. Dr. Sözer is a visiting fellow of the Institute of International Shipping and Trade Law, School of Law, Swansea University. He is also a member of the International Working Group on Maritime Autonomous Surface Ships, Committee Maritime International, as well as of the International Working Group on Ship Nomenclature, Committee Maritime International. Yes, Dr. Suzer, the floor is yours, sir. You have all the time till two o'clock. Thank you very much indeed, my respectable colleague. Dr. Chairman Dr. of the Dr. Board of Trustees, Rector Dr. of the University, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure as well as a privilege for me to make this speech. I'm therefore deeply honored, and I would like to express my feelings of gratitude to Professor Dr. Errol Erdogan, the rector of the university, and the esteemed president, Admiral, Admiral Mithin Attach, and honorable members of the International Scientific Committee for allowing me to address this prestigious congregation. Permit me to begin with a brief tour of Mediterranean. I am not a historian. I do not possess any formal diploma on history. I will only express what instinctively comes to my, to my mind when Mediterranean is mentioned. It's a sea, well, of course. Surrounded by three continents, connecting, uniting these continents. The interesting physical aspect is, or geographical aspect of the Mediterranean is, other continents are surrounded by seas, whereas in the case of Mediterranean, the sea is surrounded by continents. Mediterranean, when looked from this perspective, Looks, looks like an imprisoned between these three continents and searched a way out, made an attempt towards north through Aegean and Dardanelles to reach the Black Sea. But alas, to no avail, yet again remained captive. However, when one becomes more familiar with the Mediterranean, one begins to realize that it does not much look like a prison. Far from it, it is itself a continent in its own right, a liquid continent, connecting three continents not merely continents, but cultures, civilizations. A huge platform, a huge crossroads actually, through which so many cultures, civilizations intermingled with each other, interchange ideas, thoughts, and philosophies. 
one finds it difficult to count actually how many states, how many civilizations, cultures were born, sprang into life, flourished along its shores. The various ways in which the inhabitants, the Mediterraneans, have navigated it, have used it for purposes one cannot count and cannot even imagine. It was serving as a vast passageway uniting the three continents used so frequently, so incessantly, and so densely. The Mediterranean gave birth to three great empires, Egypt, Rome, and Ottoman Empire. So three huge empires were born along, around the Mediterranean, along its shores. The Mediterranean, after all, particularly was home to three major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, members of which are called people of the book. Only those three religions which acknowledge the books. So they were also Mediterranean values. More importantly, perhaps, the Mediterranean served as the cradle to two most important vital values of humanity. Speaking more properly, the two values, two distinguishing essentials that transformed, indeed promoted Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, in other words, to human being par excellence, philosophy and law. Greeks contributed philosophy to human beings. Rome contributed law. Refer, I shall not go into details, particularly philosophy anyway, because so that's quite beyond my area of knowledge, but let me referred to a statement, or rather a confession, by a prominent philosopher. The general characteristics, characteristics of the European, European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato, meaning whatever they are speaking since Plato and Aristotle, only repeating and making some minor additions. So philosophy is Mediterranean. That's the law. Next. But no, no doubt, number one, no doubt, all the states, small or big, bearing impact on the history or not, had rules. Yes, but only rules, not laws in the proper sense of the word. There were rules by Hammurabi, rules by Solon, rules by Pericles, but not laws of Hammurabi, not laws of Pericles, nor laws of Solon. These rules, speaking strictly, were simply orders dictates by the rulers and disappeared with the rulers. But the rules created by the Romans were not rules dictated on the whims of the occasion, but rules of law, as law is still understood today. They were rules made by lawyers the jurists thought of, developed, written down systematically. When? When? 
between 451 and 449 before Christ called 12 tables, laws of 12 tables, carved on 12 copper plates displayed at the forum for all the citizens to read and learn. Towards the end of the 19th, 18th century, a fragment was found. A fragment of one of those copper plates was found by, if I remember correctly, Theodor Mommsen and several Romanist lawyers, archaeologists, historians try to develop. And now actually we have full text of 12 tables available in the bookstores. Even in Turkey, I think in some of the, uh, the bookstores which sell the uh, law books may have in their stocks, or may bring from, from myself. Rules establish, rulers establish their organizations as they go fit and appointed such persons, again, as they go, go fit to enforce these rules. Whereas the Romans created particular separate state organs to make laws, define their functions and duties, formed also law enforcement offices, agencies, that is to say courts, defining the duties and powers of the judges. But to be more precise, one may safely claim that law became institutionalized first in Rome. Uh, within brackets, may I say that with due respect, I'm speaking about Europe, well, Western Hemisphere. I have no idea on India, on Japan, on China, they might have huge and well-developed legal systems, but it is beyond our sphere. I'm only concentrating on uh, on a huge area, which is still the government or state policy for Turkey to turn its face towards. In no universities today, rules of Solon or Hammurabi are taught, except we teach Roman law. Even in the United States, legal system of the United States was not even slightly inspired by the Roman law, but they teach Roman law. Almost in all the Ivy League universities, they have separate departments, separate institutions, and publish periodicals on Roman law. Invite speakers from other countries, particularly Italy, Germany, to teach law. European legal system is based on Roman law. Today, including Turkey, as I will very briefly describe, legal systems of all European countries and the legal system of the European Union itself is based on Roman law. The origin, the cradle was Corpus Juris Civilis, created by or upon orders of Emperor Justinianus during 529 and 534, of course, on the dominion of Christ. In Istanbul, the capital city of the Eastern Roman Empire, a Mediterranean Empire, Istanbul, again, a Mediterranean city, and this huge uh, collection of laws, the Corpus Juris Civilis, is a Mediterranean production. But using the word production rather diminishes it. It's not, to, not a refined word, I'm sorry for that, but it is something, uh, a huge invention, invention legal system, and that was in Rome, actually where, in a palace not far from here, Justinianus palace, when uh, this Corpus Juris Civilis was written down by lawyers under the guidance of Tribunianus, Tester, Sacri, Palazzi of Justinian, 
Now, in that area, in that plot of land, we have the central campus of Istanbul University, including Istanbul School of Law, so faculty of law. So it is, it began with 12 tables, 445 before Christ, 529 under Domine after Christ, and then to Europe through endeavors of certain legal or certain law professors from uni universities of Pisa, Bologna, Ravenna in Italy, called glossators or post-glossators. They study, they found fragments of Corpus Juris Civilis in some libraries or some archives of huge uh, old palaces, some monasteries, and they developed it. And then by 12th centuries, 13th centuries, Central European lawyers, mainly German lawyers, took over the task and developed a legal system called Pandecta, uh, Pandectenrecht. Pandectenrecht. Pandecta is the Greek term for corpus. So it is, again, the origin was corpus Juris civilis, then came the modern German law, Swiss law, French legal system, Spain, Italy, Turkey adapted Swiss system in 1920s, after 1926, uh, between 1926 and 1936, Civil Act, Obligations Act, Commerce Act, Civil Procedure, main codes were adapted from Switzerland. So the basis of Turkish national legal system is the Roman law. Not finished yet. Mediterranean is, is not finished yet. Not many people are involved in law. People involved in philosophy is even less. But what about sports? Sports. Dominating the whole world. <laughs> Dominating the whole world. We all forgot about vaccination in Turkey or in Germany or France. We are all talking about what will happen to Olympic Games in Japan. When it started? 776 before Christ. Panhellenic Games. With the title Panhellenic Games. And actually, they get attributed so importance. The Greeks began their chronology with 700, 776 BC. So Panhellenic Games, the origin of the modern Olympics, modern Olympiada, also signifies the chronology of Greece, and therefore it is a matter of Mediterranean. Mediterranean is a sea, of course. I say it twice, but it's a sea. Sea gave inspiration to human beings. Led human beings towards creating rules for survival. Sea gave human beings life, nourishment, wealth compelled human beings to learn, gave them the idea, the culture, to look beyond what is seen and explore what is unseen. She was and still is a major educator, compelling us to try to learn and understand what is not apparent to the naked eye. Alas, Gradually, human beings start to destruct, demolish, almost annihilate the sea. This actually this unbelievably rich source of life, the sea, it gives without asking 
for something in return or as a precondition. This unbelievably rich source of life, it is not necessary to till or sow as we should to receive returns from the ground. The sea is always fertile, always ready to feed, therefore much more generous than the mother earth, as long as it is not destroyed. Well, let me conclude by a little anecdote from again Roman law, the Mediterranean law, Mediterranean creation, Rhode Island, Rhode, I'm sorry, Rhode Island was the cradle of many rules, still almost intact, having intact applicability, almost intact. Many rules, those rules regulating seafaring and maritime affairs. The digesta, the main book, main component of Corpus Juris Civilis, in chapter 14, includes a decree by Emperor Titus Aurelius Antoninus. He was emperor between 138 and 161 of the past. He is more popularly known as Antoninus Pius. The emperor said that disputes that involve shipping and maritime affairs shall be resolved in accordance with the laws of roads, as long as they don't contravene the rules of Roman law. Those rules are still applicable. Besides, they were and still is, still are, source of inspiration to contemporary laws contemporary maritime rules, as I said, they are applic applicable almost intact in many cases, Mediterranean. To conclude, again, a dictum this time by this emperor Antoninus Pius, within brackets, he said, not, it's not me, not I, he, I indeed am Lord of the world. But the law is Lord of the sea. With heartfelt thanks for your patience and attention. Thank you very much indeed. Dear Professor Sozer, we thank you very much for your very informative and lucid speech. Now, dear guests, we are moving on with session two of the symposium. Like the morning session, we will have three speakers from three different universities. Likewise, again, we will have a question and answer period after all three presentations have been completed. And again, I would like to remind that each speaker is allocated 20 minutes for their presentations. And I will try to inform them when two minutes of their time is left. Our first speaker is Professor Arnold Cassola. He is joining us from University of Malta and his topic is on Ottoman sea power and Malta during the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent. Yes, Professor Cassola, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much and uh, thank you all for the invitation. Um, uh, I shall be speaking about what I have worked on a few years ago and uh, starting in the 90s, together with the help of uh, Professor Idris Bostan. Um, and it is about uh, the, um, um, the, the preparations for the Siege of Malta in 1565, um, when the Great Armada assembled by Suleiman the Magnificent uh, attacked Malta. So what I will be talking about is based, based, is based on the um, um, Firman and in the, on, and, and, and the, um, the minutes in the uh, Muhammad Defter of, the, of that time, and also on the Malta Severina uh, Defter, the Malta campaign register, which are to be found in the archives in Istanbul. Um, it, it, what I will be speaking about is uh, uh, episodes linked to, uh, to the Navy, but which also uh, are very basic uh, 
um, things, including, uh, you know, taking care of provisions of, of, of gunpowder uh, on the journey. Because one must remember that this journey took from Istanbul to Malta 50 days. So uh, the, the Armada left Istanbul on the uh, 29th of March, 1565, and arrived in Malta on 18th May, uh, 1565. But um, uh, the preparations had already started before. In fact, Imber tells us that in 1564 was a year when a lot of wood was cut, a lot of trees were cut, because they were used also for the building of, of galleys, which were then used to, uh, for the assault on Malta. But even Suleiman himself, the decision to attack Malta was taken in October 1564. And already on, in the 30th November 1564, um, Suleiman writes to uh, Turgut Rais in Tablus, and he asks him and he tells him that his job was to protect the Ottoman fleet during the uh, siege of Malta. Uh, Turgut was to prevent any assistance coming from Sicilia to the Maltese, to the Knights of Malta. He was to uh, protect the flanks of Piali Pasha's navy in Malta and Mustafa Pasha's uh, troops. Um, so um, uh, in order to achieve these aims, Suleiman asks Turgut to assemble for the campaign without, uh, and this is in October, in November, 1564, all the Kaliatas and cold vessels to be found in the area of Trablus, together with all the Levant captains, also the, the, the, you know, the, the, the free, free pirates, who are all to participate in the, the um, siege of Malta, and with the major job being that of protecting the armada led by Yali Pasha. Now, ironically, Turgut, who was so near Malta in Trablus, arrived 10 days after the uh, armada came from Istanbul. So uh, the armada arrived on the, 29th, on the 18th of uh, May, and it was only about 10 days later that um, Turgut and his men came from Trablus. And by this time, uh, Mustafa pa Pasha was basically blackmailed by Piali Pasha into attacking a minor fortress, Fort, Fort St. Elmo, and not the major fortress, Fort St. Angelo in, in Birgu, which was a very wrong tactical decision. And Turgut was very angry about this. But anyway, Suleiman um, um, continued to um, write to other to other governors, uh, for example, on, on around the 4th of December, he wrote to the Baylor Bay, Bay of Karaman. Uh, and uh, at the same time, he ordered the governors of Aksara, Nigida, and Kirshehir, always in Anatolia, to uh, round up the Shubashis and the Sipahis and to go over to the Dardanel Castle, if I, I don't know if I can pronounce Turkish well, Bogaz Hizari, um, in order to join the navy over there. So it is very interesting also to note in these commands how uh, Suleiman's preoccupation was that all these combatants were to be ready for action before the beginning of spring. It was a very important that the Armada left uh, before spring so that the battle and, and the raid was in spring so that they could come back by September. Because of course, for such a, a journey back to Istanbul, uh, in November or December would have could have been very very risky because of the weather. Now this is so Suleiman is, is um, communicating before the troops leave uh, with his governors in Anatolia, but he's always um, uh, co um, connecting with his governors in in Rumeli. So for example, on the twentieth of January, fifteen sixty five, he sends um, Firmans to Hassan Aga. Com the commander of the Azaps in Avloria, Avlonia, with Vlore today in Albania, and also to Shaban Bey, the governor of Ilbashan, also in Albania, what is today Albania. Um, he orders them to prepare two 18-seater Kaliatas, uh, two 18-seater uh, galleots for the campaign, and to have everything, uh, all the provisions uh, necessary for the voyage, for the troops to go um, to Malta. So we see the, the, the, the, the, the troops moving from Istanbul into Albania, Greece, etc. as we go along. Um, the governor of Midilli, 
uh, Mehmed Bey was ordered to round up soldiers in his district to assure that the Hassa Kadirga, the royal galleys, were well provisioned uh, and equipped before the departure for Malta. Um, another command uh, is sent on the 1st of February, so we have Suleiman communicating with the Anatolian part of Turkey, of the Ottoman Empire, Suleiman communicating with Vlore, with uh, Ilbashan, with Albania, the Romanian part, but he also communicates, for example, on the 1st of February 1565, nearly two months before the Armada leaves Istanbul, with Hassan Pasha, the Berlay Bay of Algiers. And he tells him why he was attacking Malta. The reason was very clear. It is written, and he says that the Knights of Malta, the infidels, were disrupting the trade routes between Istanbul, Egypt, and the rest of the Maghreb area. And they were blocking the route used by merchants, but also by pilgrims, by Ottoman pilgrims. I mean, just imagine we have Suleiman, the great Ottoman Empire, having all the Mediterranean, nearly, Greece, Albania, all North Africa, all the Maghreb, but having this little Malta, which was in this middle of the Mediterranean, the south, uh, very dangerous for any shipping that was passing by. So uh, the job of uh, the Belay Bay of Algiers, of Hassan Pasha, was to muster as many volunteer sea captains as possible, captains who were ready to take part in the Malta campaign. And he was also, to pre to, uh, like Turgut, he was to, uh, to uh, protect the flanks of the, uh, the Ottoman navy from any um, uh, infidels coming from Sicilia, and in the uh, Malta Seferina Defteri, norm normally Messina is always mentioned. So it, the, the, the um, help for the local um, uh, Christian forces what use was, was expected to come from Messina. And in fact, Don Garcia de Toledo eventually did come from, from, um, from Messina. So we see uh, also in these firmans that um, uh, uh, that Suleiman this time has learned his lesson from 1522, from Rhodos. When in 1522, the young Suleiman had taken Rhodos, he had let the Knights of St. John leave with all honors, and he let them go and take everything with them without any, um, uh, without any you know, um, um, punishment. But this time he is clear. This time he wants the order of St. John destroyed in Malta, and not, they are not to get away from Malta. The beginning of the journey. The journey starts on uh, 20, 26 Shaban, 972, 29 March, 1569, um, where the fleet is anchored in front of the Yedikule fortress in the Istanbul neighborhood of Fatih. The weather plays a, a good part in this. There was a big tempest for three, for three days, so the fleet had to go and find refuge in Gelibolu Harbor. Uh, and they had to stay there for three days, from 31st March till 2nd April. Um, as the fleet was departing, Suleiman was busy planning out the logistics. I mean, one very important factor was the supply of troops and ammunition to, the, to his uh, armada. And therefore, for example, on, on the 29th of March, he sends a command to the Bay of Selanik, in what is today Greece, Thessaloniki, highlighting the need for the fleet to be supplied with gunpowder, black gunpowder, and cannonballs. The cannonballs were always weighing 14 to 16 bukir um, uh, in, these, in these texts. Another major concern for Suleiman was providing food, food for the troops. So on the 2nd of April, 1565, when the fleet was still in Geribolu, he issued various commands to um, different cadis of Yeniser here, Chatalka, um, uh, and asking them to uh, uh, collect Peximet, Bixmet, for the Imperial fleet. Likewise, they, the two Qadis were also asked to, um, to collect grain, which obviously would be needed for, for the fleet. The same command, as we go along, on food, on Bixmet and on grain, was sent to the Qadis of Edzdin, Livadia, and Adrivos, always in, in Greece what is today Greece. So judging by the geographical lo location, it is quite evident that the, the Sultan Suleiman was ordering food provisions from different parts of his empire 
for his troops serving in the Malta campaign. Um, Suleiman was therefore trying to ensure that the fleet would be protecting, would be provided with food supplies all along the route to Malta via Albania and Greece. Um, on the 3rd of April, 1565, uh, the, the harbour in front of Gelibol was not suitable anymore for anchoring because of the strong wind. So the fleet moved across to Chardak and stayed there, and then it returned to Gelibol on the day afterward. The day before, then it stayed uh, in, the Dard in front of the Dard Dardanelle Castle until 11th April, 1565. Uh, before, uh, however, the day before it departed on the 11th from, from the Dardanelle Castle, 11th April, 1565, the Tersane Amini, Amin Effendi, went to meet the members of his fleet, and then they set out and went to the island of Bo Boscada, um, and, and on 14th April, after three o'clock, they arrived in the island of Sakis and then get near the fortress of Gerdenli. Um, interestingly, obviously, you have technical details. When you have a, a fleet of ships, you have to take care of them. You have to maintain them. So on 16th April, 1565, the, um, the fleet crossed 10 miles from Sakis, what is today Kiots, to Koyun, which is today the Greek Oinusus, uh, these little islands. And here the galleys were greased. They were given uh, their servicing as if it were a modern car, but they, and this operation lasted for four days. Uh, the greasing of the ships uh, leaving uh, um, uh, Istanbul and now in Sakit were greased for four days and, um, and uh, in the meantime, Suleiman was still was carefully planning the defense on the Armada's flank as it was traveling to Malta. So um, he uh, sent out orders to the Cadiz and the Dizdars in Rumeli and Anadolu, always to ensure that this was that the, the fleet was always taken care of as it proceeded towards Malta. Um, among the fighters, the Sultan was ensuring that even captured prisoners, Christian prisoners, would be enrolled to fight in Malta against their fellow Christians. So, for example, in a command sent to the Qadi, Nazir, and Dizdar of Mezistre um, um, in April, he was ordering the, uh, uh, he Suleiman referred to 18 Spaniards who had been found in an infidel ship destroyed in the harbor of Italy and who were imprisoned in the fortress of Mesistre. So these were to be taken to join the fleet to fight in Malta. And obviously, another important thing was the food, this continuation of supplies. And um, in a command this time to Kurd, the Amin of Modon, uh, he orders 55,000 kantars of peximet that were to be baked in Modon, and then they were to be um, distributed among different galleys. There was one problem, however, that Suleiman noticed that the bakers were not being paid for. And therefore, Suleiman admonishes the, uh, the, the Qadis, uh, in, this, in this case, the Amin of Mod Modon, to give the agreed amount of money to the Qadi of Modon without any delay. The same request is made to the Nazir of Mora, who was asked to pay the Qadi of Arcadia, today it's Kiparissia in Greece, the sum of 1,000 kantars of Peximet. So um, uh, another decree was sent to Hassan Passa on the 4th of April, 1565, to remind the Governor General of Algeria that Mustafa Pasha's intention, mission was to conquer the, um, the Malta because of the damage that was happening to the pilgrims and to the merchants who were traveling in the Mediterranean. Um, now, having left uh, the Cape of Cadiz in, on the 21st of April, the fleet came to Kizil Hizar, then to the island of Bir, and uh, on uh, Monday, 23rd April, they arrived in Athena, in Athens, where the fleet dropped anchor. Uh, it stayed in Athens for five days, and again here, uh, 
3,000 kandars of Peck cement were ordered. And interestingly, it was Piani Pasha himself who left early in the morning with a few galleys to go to Koryos to bring back the biscuits baked there. Um, so Piali Pasha himself spent two days going um, and, and coming back with these supplies because Koryos is about 40 miles away from Athena. And as regards these food provisions, Suleiman had a great deal of foresight. He not only thought of the food going to Malta, but he was also ordering, uh, for example, to the Kadi of Korinos at the end of April, was ordering him to bake Pecksmith, which was to be uh, sent to the Disda of the Athena fortress. And the, these Pecksmith were to be kept there for the return journey, so that when the fleet returned to, um, from Malta to, uh, to uh, Istanbul, there would be provisions on the way, even on the way back uh, to Malta, from Malta. Um, uh, Saturday, 28 April, the fleet arrived in Temashalik. Um, uh, it stayed there only for one day, and then 30th April, um, uh, it left again. Uh, and of course, we also had accidents on the road. So people died, soldiers died, ships, galleons sank without any battles. For, for example, on this day, that is on the 30th of April, 1565, 29 Ramadan 972, uh, in, in, during the uh, journey from Termih to the Cape of Benefse, today Monenvazia, a, a Barsa, captained by Habes Ahmed Rais, crashed into a rock and sank very, fa uh, sank very fast, as a, as a result of the damage. So Abesra Ahmed Reis, the, the captain, was put in reserve. So we see these accidents, let's see, happening as we go along. So amongst the many victims of, of, of accidents before coming to Malta, before battles, we find Yunus from uh, Taskopru, Hizir, um, who was from uh, had a Sanjak in Aydin, Ali and Nur Ali, bo both from the Sanjak of Hamid, all these were drowned in a balsa on the way to Malta. But there were other competents who formed part of the Armada who died on their way to Malta for reasons other than drowning. For example, we have um, uh, the Alabe of Menteshe, Chihan, um, the uh, Sanjak, uh, sorry, uh, Nizai Bey, the younger Kethuda of the Admiral, uh, Arslan, who had the uh, Timar in Sanjak of Karasi, etc. On Tuesday, uh, 30 Ramadan 1972, 1st of May, nearly like now. The fleet was first in the Cape of Benefse and then moved to the harbor of Pasha, today is Greece, Elafonisos. And then there was a break. There was a one day break, no work, no traveling. Why? Because it was the feast, 2nd of May was 1st Cheval 972, was Ramadan by round. And therefore, the fleet remained in harbor, in the harbor of Pasha. It only again started on its journey on the 3rd of May, when it moored in the Cape of Mania and then moved to the fortress of Koron. On Sunday, 5th Cheval, that is 6th May, 1565, the fleet was in the, near the fortress of Modon. Uh, and on 7th May, 1565, the, port, the, the fleet arrived at Anavarin. Now here, Mustafa Pasha disembarked with his imperial tent and he rested. The fleet, before coming to Malta, which was the last lap before arriving in Malta, the, the um, fleet remained in Anavarin for one whole week until Monday, 15th of May. And uh, while in Anavarin, the fleet was joined by the Bay of Rodos, Aliportuk Bay, who brought with him nine galleys, and the Bay of Selanik, Ali Bay, who came with his Zains and his Sipahis. On the 12th of May, we have a couple of people who died um, on the spot, even the, of natural death. Now, during the period of time spent in Anavarin, the Emir of Mora, Zayim Ali, was issued with another order by the Sultan to pay again, once and for all, the, those 5,250 kantars in the district of Kalamata, by paying the Kadi of Kalamata. So we see, 
uh, Solomon had to also deal with these little problems uh, of administrative problems, non-payment. Sometimes you have somebody stealing too. Of course, we don't have time for everything uh, in what we find in this documentation. But um, um, this is basically the end of the journey because on the 15th of May, 1565, 14 Cheval, the fleet sets out on the last part of its journey to Malta. Only, however, again, before leaving, it put, it, every bit, the whole fleet puts its trust in Allah and praises the Prophet Muhammad. Um, so uh, again, religion also plays an important part with the help of Allah, uh, the help of Allah is requested also on a military journey of this, of this kind. Um, on the 18th, 19th May, in the afternoon, Malta is sighted, and on the 20th May, 19 Cheval, 972, the fleet stays outside Malta, and on the day later, 21st May, Mustafa Pasha and the other soldiers land on the island and settle in their tents. The following day, 22nd May, all the troops are assembled around Mustafa Pasha's tents, and prayers are pray uh, and praises were raised to the Sultan, and Mustafa Pasha also bestowed some favors upon a number of soldiers. The siege of Malta is about to become to uh, to begin, but I think that is another story, and so I will end with my with my talk now over here. Thank you, Professor Castola. Thank you very much for your detailed information about the uh, Malta siege. Uh, thank you for your participation, sir. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Dr. Bülent Arı. He is joining us from Istanbul University and his presentation is on historical attempts for modern law of the sea, Ottomans versus Kuratius. Yes, Professor, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, dear President. Uh, my presentation uh, actually uh, is, a, uh, is a summary of a long paper, but in 20 minutes, I would like to uh, summarize them as short as possible uh, so that uh, for the audience to give an uh, overall uh, opinion uh, about uh, the topic. Uh, I have uh, deliberately has chosen this uh, uh, chapter, the historical attempts for modern law of sea, uh, and uh, and I have chosen Ottomans versus Croatius, uh, the Dutch uh, intellectual uh, has Croatius has uh, published in early 17th century a very straight thesis on, on this topic. He is well known in international relations and the international law students and the, uh, among the scholars. Uh, but actually, there are uh, various publications much before him. So we can uh, consider Hugo Grotius as a latecomer to the arena of international relations and the law of the sea. He is a latecomer uh, at least three or four centuries after the uh, early international relations, international law, and especially sea law, naval law. Uh, so, uh, as far as possible, I can, uh, I will give a summary information about the Islamic principles and Ottoman uh, regulations uh, and Hugo Grotius uh, on naval seas, freedom of the seas, and international relations. So the pioneers of international law, particularly naval law, is generally accepted as generated by Western scholars. However, sophisticated clauses regarding naval regulations can be detected in the Ottoman calculations much earlier. So I have published an article, uh, a book chapter uh, in this regard, 10 years ago. Uh, it is also uh, both uh, in naval law, international law, and uh, Privateering law, the law of corsairs, as one of the uh, contributors in, in, in the morning session uh, has given some uh, 
some contributions about the terminology of the Corsair and the Pirates. Maybe we can discuss this, up, discuss this uh, terminology after the end of uh, my presentation. Uh, but Hugo Grotius is not very well known uh, in the contemporary uh, scholars. His philosophy uh, is published in early 17th century, but explored, revisited, and revived only in the 20th century. Uh, so we should, uh, before uh, discussing on the philosophy and the doctrines of Hugo Grotius, uh, we should first mention uh, on the first principles of international law and the law of the seas. We should mention uh, Tratado de Tordesilla, Treaty of Tordesilla, in 1494. Uh, it was uh, signed in Tordesilla in Spain on uh, 1494 and authenticated at Setupa, Portugal, divided the newly discovered lands outside Europe. So this agreement uh, divided the world into two, between Portugal and Spain. Uh, so it is. Uh, it started from the uh, Cape of Verde Islands of the uh, west coast of Africa, and uh, it is 370 leagues uh, west of Cape Verde, Verde Islands. Uh, so it was a demarcation line between uh, Portuguese and uh, Spain. Uh, so, what was the first islands uh, mentioned in this uh, agreement? It was the islands entered by Christophus Columbus on his first voyage. So, the lands to the east would belong to Portugal and the lands to the west to the Castilia, to the Spain. Uh, uh, so, the other side of the world was divided by the uh, Treaty of Zaragoza, signed on uh, 22nd of April, 1529. So the world is divided into two, uh, the demarcation, uh, the first agreement treaty of Tordesilla was made, uh, but uh, treaties of Treaty of Zaragoza in 1529, so it divided the world in the intermeridian period. So they did not actually know what was the geography of the world actually. Uh, so it was also specified the Treaty of Zaragoza uh, specified the anti-meridian to so the line of demarcation. Demarcation specified in the Treaty of Tordesilla. Uh, so the other European powers did not sign the treaty and generally ignored it. And, uh, and especially Protestant uh, countries after the Reformation, they never accepted this. Uh, so <clears throat> by uh, in it started in. 1493, Pope Alexander VI, uh, he promulgated a bull uh, that uh, the islands west of pole to pole line, 100 leagues of any of the islands of the Azores and the Cape Verde Islands would belong to Castilla and although territory under Christian rules as Christmas of 1492 would remain untouched. So this is very interesting. Uh, so the world is divided between two countries and all uh, all the world discovered uh, by the and dominated by infidels uh, and by the Muslims they call it Mohammedans uh, would be open to uh, Portuguese and Spanish domination in future uh, so there is uh, in my uh, publication I will give a uh, detailed information on these demarcation lines, how they uh, make some discussions uh, after the voyage of Columbus. Uh, so, but very little of the newly divided area had actually been seen by the Europeans. The Europeans had not seen all these areas. Uh, they, have, uh, they have divided the world into two, uh, but an unknown map, under unknown map, there is not a uh, a definite map of the whole world. So they thought that uh, it will be divided by the treaty. So what will happen in future? So <clears throat> Spain attempted to stop the Portuguese uh, by advance 
their advance in Asia by claiming the Meridian Line. So the Meridian Line will run throughout the world uh, and the eastern part in the Pacific also uh, belongs to Spain. So there are discussions and uh, conflictual uh, discussions among uh, the kings. Uh, but this did not uh, stop uh, over there. Uh, uh, you know, in 15, uh, 1580, Portugal was annexed by Spain, Castilla, and until 1640, uh, the whole area also uh, on the share of Portugal was also captured by Spain. So the whole world uh, is under the domination of naval uh, navigation, trade, commercial activity, uh, and uh, belongings uh, such as uh, fortresses, uh, naval operations, military operations would belong to Spain in this uh, period. So this treaty was preceded by the uh, Treaty of Madrid in 1750. Uh, so uh, this treaty has lasted more than uh, 250 years. Uh, the Protestant maritime powers, such as England and the Netherlands, uh, and also Catholic France, did never accept this uh, agreement. Uh, the Treaty of Tordesilla only specified the line of demarcation, starting from Cape Verde Islands. But what about the details? The details of the borders were to be settled by a joint voyage. So this voyage never occurred. So there was also always uh, uh, confusions uh, and conflicts uh, among uh, Spain and Portugal. Uh, so uh, what had this uh, agreement brought to us? Uh, so with this agreement, uh, Brazil and Molucca, Molucca, Portugal eventually controlled uh, with addition to Brazil and Molucca, Angola, Mozambique, Portuguese, Guinea, Sao Tome and Principe uh, in Africa, and also several bases and territories in Muscat, Burmus, Bahrain in the Persian Gulf, uh, Goa, Bombay, Daman and Diu in India, Ceylon and Malacca, and uh, there, there are, they have bases there, and present-day Indonesia and Makassar, Solor, Ambon and Portuguese Timor an anthropod base of Macau and the anthropod enclave of Tejima, Nagasaki, in the Far East. So these are the whole uh, domination of Portugal. Uh, so what about the uh, control of Spain? So west, Western regions in the Americas, ranging from today's United States to present Argentine, uh, to Philippines and bases in Ternat and Formosa. Uh, in the 17th century. Uh, so uh, the uh, claim of domination has uh, lasted until the Treaty of Madrid in 1750. So uh, the King John V of Portugal and Ferdinand VI of Spain signed the Treaty of Madrid, uh, so in which both parties sought to establish the borders between Spain, uh, Brazil, and Spanish America, admitting that the Treaty of Tordesilla has been superseded and was considered void. Uh, but it, it, this did not stop here. Uh, so, for example, uh, Chile in the uh, 20th century, he defended the Treaty of Tordesilla, uh, uh, this principle for Antarctic sector, extending to the merid meridian of the South Pole, and the treaty made by Spanish or Portuguese, Portuguese, all undiscovered land south of the pole. Uh, so they were uh, claiming the undiscovered lands in the South Pole. For example, Indonesia also took possession of the Netherlands, New Guinea in 1962, supporting its claim by stating the empire of Majapahit, which was the part that also part of the of Tordesilla. Uh, also, Argentine in the 20th century claimed South of Auckland Islands, uh, relying on the uh, articles of Treaty of Tordesilla. So here uh, we coincide with the uh, 
with Hugo Grotius. He, uh, he was born in 1583 and died in 1645. So uh, he coincides with the restrictions of the Treaty of Tordesilla in 1604, 120 years after its conclusion. Uh, so he was a Dutch humanist, diplomat, lawyer, theologian, jurist, poet, and playwright. Uh, so in 1604, he became involved in legal proceedings by the sizer of Dutch merchants of a Portuguese character uh, in Far East. Uh, the Portuguese were making commercial activities in those regions, uh, and uh, one of the Karak, uh, Santa Caterina, uh, he, uh, Krotius' uh, cousin, cousin Captain Jacob Ernsker, captured this uh, Portuguese character named Santa Caterina uh, uh, off the shore uh, today Singapore in 1603. He was employed in the uh, United Amsterdam Com Company, uh, a part of Dutch East India Company. Uh, actually, he was not authorized to capture a Portuguese ship, but it was a, a huge ship in uh, those days standards and laden with very precious commercial materials. So the booty was uh, so huge that uh, it was, uh, for example, uh, in return of the cargo, the whole uh, cargo, these precious materials were sold uh, in Amsterdam, in the port of Amsterdam. So it was uh, some of the members of the uh, company, uh, they rejected the capture and sale of this cargo, and some of them thought that this is a booty and uh, this is a lawful activity uh, by the company. Uh, so he has written uh, a treatise uh, Defending that this is a just war. Uh, this is not a piracy. This is a just war, and just war can be done also uh, among the Christian nations. Uh, he also, uh, so there is a, uh, a juridical uh, activity uh, there. So he must have written uh, this treatise to defend his company and his cousin. Uh, he also has written another important uh, treatise. Uh, Mare Liberum, the pre in 1609. So five years later, his second important publication came. So he also defended the uh, free seas, freedom of the seas. Uh, so this doctrine is also uh, very important uh, in the Western world, uh, not in uh, the Eastern world, not in for Ottoman cases, because uh, much before in the Ottoman capitulations, we can detect uh, the articles regarding the freedom of the seas, freedom of navigation, and freedom of no commercial activity. Uh, I have detected all the relevant uh, articles, the capitulations. Uh, I have collected uh, data from Venetian capitulations, uh, English and Dutch capitulations. Uh, I have published uh, these. Uh, articles in a, uh, in a chapter of a book. Uh, but this is very, it is very interesting. At this time, English writer John Selden, he was uh, defending uh, the uh, Mare Clausum, the Clause Sea. So instead, he was uh, defending not the uh, freedom of the seas, uh, but the closing of the seas. Uh, but actually, the English uh, defense was uh, uh, it can be uh, not it can be controlled only for uh, the surrounding of the English uh, island, the whole Britannia island, not uh, the Far East. Uh, so I'm trying to summarize uh, the uh, article. He also published in France when he was an. Uh, he was in France. He escaped to France uh, from the today's Netherlands because of some political uh, and uh, religious uh, conflicts. In France, he has written his famous book, De Rebelli Ac Pacis, uh, in Latin, on the law of war and peace. So uh, when 
uh, war and peace is just among the Christian nations. Uh, the principles of natural law. Uh, so he divided his book into three. So his conception of war and justice, uh, and in the second uh, part, just causes of war, self-defense, preparation of injury and punishment. And the third uh, part uh, is the conduct of war, how the rules and the conduct of war. Uh, so uh, if we touch upon the influence of uh, Proteus and his uh, doctrine in later periods, uh, periods uh, some of the uh, philosophers uh, has adopted his opinions and some of them uh, rejected it. Uh, for a diplomatic uh, mission, for example, King James, King James the sixth and uh, the first of Great Britain, they reacted negatively on his uh, doctrine. Uh, some uh, Protestants, Peter Bale, uh, uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, and uh, for example, in Francis Hutchinson, Adam Smith, David Hume, Thomas Wright, held him high esteem. Uh, but French Enlightenment, uh, for example, Voltaire, uh, finds him uh, simply boring. Uh, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau has developed an alternative uh, uh, conception of human nature. Uh, so uh, the influence of Hertius declined following the rise of positivism in the uh, field of international law. Uh, but the Carnegie Foundation, has reissued and retranslated uh, his uh, book on the law of war and peace after the First World War. Uh, only in the 20th century, early 20th century, uh, he was uh, discovered uh, later. Professor, you have three minutes left. Uh, excuse me. You have three minutes. Three minutes. Oh, very, uh, very limited time. So it was the introductory part, but maybe we discuss it much later. Uh, so, uh, he has uh, advocated the freedom of the seas, freedom of the navigation, and uh, let me uh, read some, uh, just some uh, uh, small articles uh, from his book. He says that uh, God has compared by the law of nations, uh, said, navigation is free for anyone. So, God had compassed the earth is navigable, and every side around about although the particles has been laws of those countries. Uh, they should go wrong to prohibit the Dutch, he says, if they stop the passage and trade of the Hollanders. Uh, and also, uh, he also rejects the idea that the sea or right of navigation is not proper to the particles. By title of the Pope's gift, they claim that the Pope has gifted them uh, the, uh, these geography, and uh, they are prohibited to make navigation uh, and trade in these areas. Uh, so I have a special chapter for the maritime law in the West, but uh, I will not touch on now. Uh, but if we uh, uh, look at uh, the international law and naval law in Islam, uh, according to Western writers, uh, they are very late in the late 19th, even in the late 19th century after the Treaty of Paris, uh, they did not accept the uh, international law uh, to include the Islamic countries into the law. Uh, we can remember of the inclusion of the Ottoman Empire into the Treaty of Paris in uh, 1856. Uh, in the Islamic law, uh, we should mention here uh, the writings of Mohammed Shaibani and the international law, uh, but uh, much expanded, uh, we should discuss here on the law of the sea and the international law, the, the articles uh, in the capitulations, uh, has, which has granted to uh, Genoese first, to Venetians, France, uh, English, uh, and the Dutch. Uh, the general capitulation, capitulation has ended in the classical form in 1612, the last one has given to, uh, to the Dutch. So in these articles, uh, I have uh, noted for the headlines, uh, for example, English and Dutch work has established a network of, of consulates in the Mediterranean. 
So this is not common in the Western uh, Western world, uh, even uh, by the right, even not included in the writings of Bibliotheus. Uh, for example, there are uh, detailed information in this uh, in these capitulations about the status of Bailo. Bailo is not uh, an ambassador in the modern terms, but a representative of the uh, foreign merchants. So this is also uh, in very interest uh, brought by the uh, Ottoman Empire, uh, and also uh, an Italian term, Cotimo. Cotimo is also brought uh, by the Ottoman capitulations. It is a practice, uh, but also written in the articles, uh, which is called in Turkish, Elçilik ve Konsolosluk Hakkı. So a special uh, percentage was uh, allocated to the uh, to the Bailo and the to the ambassador, let's say, and the consuls, so that they can uh, run their uh, expenditures. Another important uh, issue in the Ottoman capitulations uh, is the flag country. So, uh, as you can imagine, in those years, uh, the flags can be easily changed by the ships, by the captains. Uh, so, for example, a Dutch ship, uh, which is sailing from Amsterdam, uh, when he uh, reached to uh, Venice, for example, they were raising French flag. So when he was from Venice, when he was sailing to Smyrna, he was carrying an English flag. Uh, so there was always a uh, conflict between the consuls and the Cotimo, the percentage, El Chilik, the consuls to which we can uh, summarize in Turkish. Uh, so the issue of uh, which is called Bandera, uh, is also clearly put uh, in the Ottoman documents. These are not valid. These are not, uh, uh, uh, we cannot detect all these issues in the uh, doctrines of Grotius uh, and the Western academicians' writings. So we can say that these Selden, John Selden and Grotius are latecomers to the law of uh, uh, navigation and naval law of both and both sea. Uh, so uh, we should make uh, further examinations and further uh, diggings in the archive regarding this uh, detailed information about the freedom of the seas, naval law, and international law. Uh, as you can uh, imagine, very few people, very few historians and uh, from the law faculties, the scholars are studying on these issues. Uh, my uh, PhD study is on the uh, Ottoman-Dutch relationship. So I have detected during my PhD study in uh, Leiden University. I have uh, collected all these informations, uh, but uh, a special PhD study should be made uh, on this topic. Uh, there are uh, detailed information, but our time is very limited, uh, so I, I don't want to uh, uh, use much time, uh, and I believe in your patience for future uh, discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ali, for your informative presentation about early attempts and historical perspective on the law of the sea. Thank you, I'm sure that people will get in touch with you on this. Uh, in the last portion of this session two, uh, our speaker is Ms. Ece Yüksel. Uh, she's a PhD candidate and joining us from Istanbul Giritepe University. Her topic is an assessment of the Suez shipyard in the light of Ottoman archive documents. Yes, Ms. Yüksel, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, present at this distinguished uh, meeting. Um, I will talk to you uh, the Suez shipyard in Ottoman Empire period. Uh, we can share uh, this my PowerPoint. Uh, 
uh, an assessment of the Suez uh, shipyard in the light of Ottoman achievements. Um, the history of uh, Suez shipyard. Uh, in ancient times, the trade route between the Nile and Red Sea, which dates to the time of Pharaohs, uh, used to follow the eastern desert. Uh, however, this route was not safe uh, because Normans attacked the caravans during this journey. Uh, during this period, trade is uh, using alternative roads headed north, uh, northeast uh, of Memphis. Uh, caravans advancing north uh, the, in the Sinai Peninsula, the first stop at uh, Suez Harbor and then crossed the Wally and uh, along the uh, Red Sea coast. Uh, today, the Red Sea, which retains this uh, feature, um, is connected uh, from the Mediterranean to Oman. Uh, communication that started with the trade uh, in ancient Egypt was provided by the port of uh, shipyard Suez, uh, while today the European connection uh, with the Red Sea continues through the Suez Canal. Uh, Asia, Asia uh, the rich resources have attracted Europeans in the Roman times. Uh, the Roman Empire organized expeditions along the Indo-Arabian and Indian Red Sea roads. Uh, the precious commercial goods of the East arrived the ports of Baghdad, Syria, and Aleppo. Uh, first with ships uh, coming out the Indian Ocean. Uh, some ships uh, have used the ports of uh, Red Sea and Arabia. Uh, the goods um, that came here were uh, exported to first uh, the port of Alexandria uh, and then to Byzantine uh, and European. Uh, since at the beginning of the uh, 15th century, the influence of Portuguese empire has been felt in the South Seas. The Portuguese empire uh, which wanted to uh, own Eastern uh, trade. Uh, and uh, commercial uh, alone began to clash with Menluk state, uh, which dominated part of this trade route. Uh, Salman and uh, Hussein Reis, uh, two sailors in charge of Memluk salary, uh, salary um, uh, in the, uh, the did not give a passage to the Portuguese navy, the Portuguese were defeated, uh, but did not give up the uh, fight. The following year, they arrived uh, in Jida port. And the purpose of the Ottoman Empire, Venice, Mamluks, and Safavid state is the same, uh, to control uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and Red sea, uh, sea trade alone. It is understood that these states, which have disagreements among themselves, uh, cooperate when it came uh, to the trade. Uh, although the Ottomans were at odds military and politically uh, with the Mamluks, it is known that timber was exported to Egypt from Anatolia. Uh, on the other hand, uh, another commodity as available as spice and a copper mine, uh, which is used to means of payments. Uh, the situation uh, shows us that Venice, uh, the uh, Ottoman Empire used the uh, novel power of uh, Mediterranean transport, uh, export of goods, uh, but sub, uh, super, uh, super uh, powers uh, have managed to make uh, the copper trade profit profitable of them. Uh, and uh, however, copper is the use in ball casting as well as uh, its uh, commercial importance. The Ottomans succeed in the Eastern expedition uh, using uh, this strategic material correctly. Uh, one of the states uh, fighting to get rid of the danger uh, of Portugal is the Ottoman Empire, which advanced in the maritime affairs uh, and expanded uh, its trade network from the beginning of uh, 15th century to beginning of the uh, 16th century. 
the Islamic world uh, saw the uh, Ottomans uh, as the only way to get rid of uh, danger of Port uh, Portugal. Uh, the Ottomans began uh, to uh, organize expedition in the region. Uh, within the Islamic states, it is necessary uh, to consider the Ottomans uh, as the state uh, that best evolved uh, naval power. Uh, the main reason for this situation uh, that uh, that uh, has sufficient resources in the terms of mines and timber. Uh, the second reason is the lack of uh, Mediterranean and Black Sea uh, coastline. Uh, the Ottoman capital it is also on the seafront. Uh, the Ottomans, aware of the importance of the spice route, uh, route uh, repaired uh, and developed the Suez shipyard, uh, which left over from the Mamluks in the Red Sea. Uh, masters and military personnel uh, from Istanbul and Anatolia uh, are provided from uh, shipyard uh, personnel. Uh, there were uh, many perks uh, in the Navy uh, during uh, the time of Mamluks. Uh, one, uh, the, one, one of them is Salman Reis. Uh, during the, uh, the reign of Salman Reis, uh, 20 ships were uh, seen uh, in Suez. Uh, during the time uh, in Old Suleyman Pasha, uh, Turkish means Southern Suleyman Pasha, uh, 16 uh sorry 18 ships uh, were built in the suez shipyard in the middle of the 15th century under uh, command of egypt governor uh, suleiman pasha uh, a total of eight ships uh, were built swiss uh, shipyard in the order uh, to fight uh, the portuguese sailing in yemen and indian sea uh, there were uh, 45 galleys and uh, 600 soldiers at Suez shipyard. Uh, Suez was especially important uh, rival uh, naval base during uh, this period. Uh, however, uh, Ottoman uh, por uh, to Portuguese relations deteriorated again when the Portuguese Navy uh, which arrived in the Red Sea uh, a year later, uh, loot ships in the Yemen uh, and uh, Aden. Uh, at the uh, Swiss shipyard under control of the uh, Piriris uh, this time. And uh, our two uh, documents. Uh, uh, about this testimony taken after the rumors and uh, in our Suleyman Pasha and his, his soldier were uh, mistreating the people and action against the law. Uh, the timber, uh, iron, nails, uh, sailcloth and similar materials record uh, uh, for the ships to be built in the Suez shipyard. Um, were uh, supplied uh, from the sellers in of Tertaneo Amire uh, in Istanbul or the surrounding area and craftsmen uh, to be employed were sent from Istanbul. Uh, 300 people worked for uh, eight ships to be built, uh, built uh, in Suez, Alexandria and Rashid in uh, 15th century. Um, Necessary materials were transported from Istanbul. Uh, in the middle of the 15th century, under the command of Egyptian governor Suleyman Pasha, a total uh, of uh, eight ships. Ali Çelebi, responsible for the shipyard in Istanbul, was sent to the Ch uh, Suez shipyard to build uh, a ship for the navy to be built in Jidde. According to accountant uh, records, the Suez shipyard, the expenses made by the Tersane Mini uh, for the new ships built in front of Suez. In the 15th century, 
amount of two, uh, two billion coins, uh, name, same uh, mean akçe, uh, among the items purchased are uh, shovel, uh, raw uh, iron, worries nails, sale clothes, uh, approximately 450,000 coins uh, were paid to uh, pay ship building materials of the and personnel to work. Architect uh, Istamet Manol of Greek origin uh, was commissioned to the design the ships uh, to be built in Suez, Suez shipyard. He was paid 500 coins as a salary. Uh, it is known that uh, Sleiman Pasha hand over the accounting book of the shipyard to Ali Celebi in the first half of the 15th century. Uh, when he was uh, the governor uh, of Egypt, it is understood that both of them were inspected for these expenses incurred uh, for the construction of Neve. The most active period for the Suez shipyard in the 16th century was undoubtedly uh, the naval preparations uh, in Suez for Indian expedition of uh, Suleiman Pasha, the Ottoman naval activities in the Red Sea, and the Indian Ocean uh, gradually increased the naval need that uh, was built in the Suez shipyard. And the payment navy was located here. Uh, 25 ships uh, were built in Suez shipyard in the 15th century uh, and five galleys, uh, 20 galleys and um, is and the ex existing ships in the uh, 16th century were repaired. During this period, in the other time, uh, prepared the Suez Navy for the Navy voyage, uh, care was taken to make regular ship repairs and maintenance. And two officers were assigned uh, for maintenance uh, of the Suez port, along with shipyard uh, and armor. In the uh, 15th century, the Aceh Sultanate, which asked for help from the Ottoman Empire, could not be helped due to Yemen rebellion. Kurdoğlu Hızır Reis could not go to uh, expedition to, to the Sultanate uh, of Aceh, uh, which was waiting for help in Sumatra. It is understood that the state continued weapons due to uh, rebellion in the Yemen. Uh, it is determined that it's living uh, again. According to the census by the Swiss captain, the military ammunition in Suez in a total uh, of 200 cannons. In addition to 9,000 uh, round balls of various size uh, made of iron were found. In addition to these ammunition for cannons, uh, 2,500 rifles, um, 3,000 round balls and uh, many rifles were sent from the Topane in Istanbul. Uh, Piali Pasha was asked to provide uh, 2,000 rifles and uh, 7,000 round balls. On the other hand, as a, uh, all the ships in Suez sailed for the operation to be carried out in uh, Yemen, it was ordered to rebuild uh, five ships in Suez shipyard. It is understood from uh, archive records that uh, the timbers built in uh, Suez were sent from uh, Sinop and Samsun. From here, it is understood that not only ship timber, but also the necessary materials uh, to be used in the sh uh, ship uh, building are transported to Alexandria uh, and from uh, there the nearest place uh, via uh, the Nile by ships. Uh, the materials were then uh, brought to the Suez uh, by camel. Uh, the other archive document, it is explained that the tax uh, to be paid cannot be collected because in uh, an in Indian ship, burning to the Suez uh, part not uh, loaded enough, uh, while the figure determined by the state was uh, 2,000 akçe. This ship paid to state is only 20 akçe. Uh, foundation Galon sailing in the Red Sea. It is known that with the service provided by Ottoman foundations, they spread Islam. Uh, first, the Anatolia in that uh, Balkans foundation in Red Sea 
prison were involved in uh, both spread of Islam and uh, shipment of uh, cereals. Uh, ship at the Suez shipyard are often used for this shipment uh, cereals. According to the archive documents on subject, Huram Sultan, uh, wife of the Sultan Suleiman, established foundation in Mecca and Medina. And it was determined that foundation galons were used to establish of the, these foundations. These galons traveled between uh, Suez and Jidda. Uh, Egyptian uh, governor led Sultan Foundation's account of the lease of two ships sailing between Suez and Jidda. A conclusion, uh, it's safe to say that the Ottoman start the shipbuilding process at Suez shipyard after the first step taken in the early 15th century by the sending uh, ship supplies and masters to Suez shipyard, which was operating under Memluk Sultan Kansu Gavri. After uh, Suez uh, Sultan Selim uh, conquest of Egypt, uh, the Portuguese Ottoman naval uh, wars began with the beginning of the Ottoman uh, domination in the Red Sea uh, and the Indian Ocean. In the 16th century, Salman Reis, Saidi Ali Reis, uh, Inan Suleyman Pasha, Murat Reis, and Hazir Reis completed the conquest of uh, this region between Sudan and Yemen uh, with drawing shipbuild in the Suez shipyard. Another of the most important activities in the Suez shipyard is the navy prepared at the recruits uh, of uh, Aceh Sultanate. Uh, this concurs and the response to request for uh, help and indi indicative of ability of the Ottoman Navy to fight in the open seas in the 16th century. Uh, on the other hand, it's known that uh, the Suez shipyard operated until uh, the 17th uh, century. Uh, thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Yüksel, for your document-based detailed presentation. We appreciate your Thank input. You. Uh, with Ms. Yüksel's presentation, we have completed session two. Again, I would like to thank all three speakers for their contributions. And we are going to have a 30 minutes question and answer period before moving on to uh, section three, session three. And I I'll, I'll just, with you, uh, Professor Kuta, just wait for a second, please. Uh, just for the newcomers, I should remind that you're expected to ask your questions in written format using the chat box at the uh, bottom of your screen. And please Id uh, identify yourself and whom you're asking the question to and the question itself. And please narrow your question down to the topics presented in this uh, session. I already have three questions, and including uh, Professor Kuto, I, I guess it's going to be four. So I'm still expecting your questions in written format. Meantime, yes, Professor Kuto. Yes, well, I, uh, I have three questions also, but the problem is that uh, I take time, we take time uh, writing them, you know? Okay. <laughs> So ahead. if we could submit to the speakers directly, I think we would gain a little time for the discussion. Otherwise, we'll take time. Uh, sorry. So if you allow me, uh, the chairman, Mr. Chairman, to to ask directly. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I have one one question for each uh, speaker. So my first question would be addressed to uh, Professor Casola uh, on the um, on the cruise uh, before before the expedition or before attaining Malta. Okay, uh, you talked about um, the presence of uh, some Spaniards in the cruise. But especially, uh, well, first of all, I would like to know if you have an average of the number of uh, these Westerners on the on the on the on the cruise. Yeah. Well, <laughs> my second question is attached to that one. Uh, perhaps you can answer uh, to to to the second one. Is uh, when you're talking about you talked about replacement. 
uh, of men who die uh, the before uh, arriving to, to, to Malta. So uh, how was this replacement made exactly? Uh, you know, in a, in a concrete way, uh, because it's some kind of intriguing um, issues uh, around, around this. Uh, shall I put together all my answers to the different speakers? Yes, please go, go ahead. And yeah, uh, then my, my, second, my second question is for uh, uh, Professor, for Dr. Bulent Aru. Um, on the question of the Tordesillas issue. And by the way, I have here the Tordesillas. I don't know if you can see, you see the Tordesillas Treaty, the original, yes, uh, in the city from Tordesillas. Uh, we have been working very much, as you can imagine, on Tordesillas, I, and I, I just, Publish a big article on the cartography uh, of the expedition of Magellan uh, around the Moluccan issue. So you you talked about the the the, the issue of the Treaty of Tordesillas, but what I would like to know is that in if the in the Ottoman Empire at that moment, someone had had been aware of what that was at stake uh, with the Treaty of the Tordesillas in, in terms of maritime um, law. Because the, the question of Tordesillas had been always been analyzed by the historiography until now, very much on a Western perspective, the Atlantic, then the selling of the Moluccans islands archipelago uh, by, by, by the Spanish to the Portuguese. Uh, then all the issues related with the treaty for the possession of Argentina in, in, in, in, in the 18th century with the Treaty of Madrid and, and, and, and also the extension of Brazil we in the end become smaller than it was supposed to be. So my question is, was there any echo uh, or any statement or any interest uh, about the issue? Even in a later period, I mean, uh, in a diachronic perspective, in the later uh, authors, uh, Ottoman authors about this question because we know that uh, Francis I of France was simply outraged by the Treaty of Tordesillas. He said, where in the Testament of Adam is written that the world should belong to the Spanish and to the Portuguese with the Treaty of Tordesillas? You know, this is a quotation of Francis of France that is false, it's a fake, but it's very interesting. Thing. So, and my third question is uh, for um, Mrs. Yuxel uh, on the shipyards, because I work on the on, on the shipyards for the 16th century um, uh, connections with the Red Sea and with the, and the, and with the Portuguese. And I would like to uh, uh, just to state a few points which may be important and to know if you agree with me. This is the, my question. Uh, Salmon Reis didn't close the entrance of the Red Sea. He was not able never to do it as the Portuguese could not enter really uh, the Red Sea. This is a, a very important point. The second one is the issue of Ache. I published a big article in Tutsika in 2015 in France on the challenge between Ache, the Ottomans and the Portuguese. But unfortunately, we have a hegemony of the English language. So the article is in French and is read, has been read for some public in Turkey, but only the people that read French. So I would like to have this 
article translated because it shows that the help, the Ottoman help to Ace was a diplomatic help, but the Ottomans were never, they didn't want to be involved with Ace because the issue was not to help the Muslims in Ace against the Portuguese. The issue was the contrary. Ace was having an expansionist politics in Southern Asia, and he needed the help of the Ottomans to expel the Portuguese. And the Ottomans didn't want to be involved in this conflict. So they really prepared a few weaponry and a few ships, but it was not sent. And it was not really because of the Kurtolu uprise. Um, uh, it was not the main point. The main point is now we have all the documents, the Ache documents, the Ottoman documents, the Portuguese documents, and we have a full overview. No, the Ottoman uh, Sultan, the, the empire didn't want to be involved in Ache. So they sent back the, the invoice, the ambassadors from Ache saying, we will give you help, but a small help. So you see, this has to be reconfigurated and reinterpreted in a much wider transnational history, not only in a, a, a regional history. So I would like, uh, to share this point of view with you and to know if you have more evidence in the Ottoman records uh, of uh, some other involvement, especially in the years of 1560 to 1508, when you have the activities of someone like Ali Beg in the, in the, in, in the, in the, let's say, uh, the area from the Red Sea to the coast, coasts from Mogadishu uh, until the Persian Gulf or the Arab Persian Gulf. So all my questions. Thank you very much, Professor Kuto. Thank you very much for your questions. I'm sure we can start with Professor Kuto. So, uh, yes. Okay. Are you here? Um, I don't know if I can answer your questions. What is, what, uh, as regards the, um, uh, the captain uh, and his crew of the Barça that, were, that uh, was sunk on the way to Malta, and there were another <laughs> couple of others, what the documents say, I'm told, this is, this is taken from the Malta Zeferina Defteri, yeah. which, we, which we published in uh, 1998 with Idris Bostan. Uh, so you have the whole text, the whole 112 pages of it's an administrative record. It's not a historical record of the siege of Malta, but yeah. it is the uh, Sipahis, the Subashis, etc. Yeah. on in Malta asking for rewards for increase in salary, etc. And but there is also a description of the journey coming to Malta. Mm -hmm. And these were put in reserve, which actually means that of course since he had no longer any galley to command. They were kept in reserve or anything that might have happened uh, on the way or during the battles, but it is not specified what, what yeah. if there was any specific task. As regards the foreigners, what I, um, what I have uh, mentioned, the 18 Spaniards who were yeah, prisoners, yeah. et cetera, that is taken from a firman from the Muhammad Efter, number, yeah. six, number six, I think. But yeah. if you go into the, so I cannot give you an amount of uh, non-Muslims who participated on the Ottoman side against yeah. the Christians. But in the, again, in the text of the Malta campaign register, there are quite a few references to Zimis. Ah, yeah, okay. So non-Muslim um, uh, com combatants who were yeah. on the spot in Malta and who were going to, uh, some of them said he had died, okay, but others were asking also for promotions Yes. And for, and for uh, an increase in salary and yes. whatever. So there were a number. Mm -hmm. I don't, I cannot count them now offhand because I don't have them on me. Keep in mind that the whole force is invading Malta were, are estimated to have been around 40,000. 40,000, uh, yes. yes. Okay. Including oh. obviously those coming also from, 
from Trablus, from Algeria, from Jerba, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah, um, and amongst these, there were certainly there were uh, non-Muslim, uh, even Christian yeah. fighters. But the exact number, <laughs> I, I I cannot tell from from my knowledge. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Professor yeah. Kostova. Uh, I guess Professor Alvi is ready with his answer, or should be. Are you ready, sir? Uh, well, sh sh well, uh, shall I say something? Yes, I am quite pleased about the answer because uh, in the case of the cruise of uh, Hadim Suleiman Pasha, Hadim Suleiman, he goes to India with the cruise that a great number of them were composed by Westerners that he uh, just took in different uh, areas of the Mediterranean, mainly in Alexandria. And what is interesting is that we have been working on these records and we know now I can establish the connections between these uh, individuals uh, who knew themselves. Uh, one of them, he led a record of the whole trip uh, from Alexandria until, until India, so through the Red Sea. And I published it uh, in Italy in the University of Naples. So uh, we, we are, you know, seeing many similarities in the recruitments. Of course, they were not only Westerners, but they were also Westerners. That was the sense of my question about Malta, because it's Okay, Hadim Suleiman, it's 1538, but we are on the same Mediterranean, Red Sea, Indian Ocean context when you come to the cruise. And I am actually working on the cruise of Saidi Ali Reis in the Indian, in the Indian Ocean. And it's, uh, it's giving many surprising uh, results. So, Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, Professor Alu, do you have an answer? Um, no, to be honest. On, on this. I, I, okay. I really, uh, as I said, I only worked on this, on the Mata Seferina Deftery. And uh, as I said, um, there, there, are, there are a number of, of non-Christians, uh, of non-Muslims, of non -Muslims, um, but um, uh, I cannot be more precise than what I have to tell you. It's an interesting issue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Yüksel, are you ready for your answer? Uh, of course, yeah. just, one, just one other thing too, then, just to mention. There were also uh, people, both Ottomans and Christians, who during the siege of Malta uh, exchanged sides yes. and, con and converted. So in the four or yes, five yes. months, these, this is registered. It is yes. registered both in the Western sources, Barbidi Correggio, but even in this Malta Severina Deftery with their name. Yes, yes, yes. Of the these traitors yes, who yes, uh, yes. crossed over and yes. became Christian but, and or, you, or vice versa. You know, it's the same in the Indian Ocean to the point that I found a Portuguese document related to uh, a captive that they found in an Ottoman galley from, uh, from Hadim Oliman Pasha. And this, this individual was a Portuguese mm -hmm. uh, who had converted to Islam. And he was in the crew of Hadim Suleiman Pasha. Uh, and he went to India in the cruise. So this is one of the cases. So okay. this is, this is shifting yeah. the same. Oh. I think it's also a question of taxation. Huh? Yes, when yes. You have to pay uh, a tax if you are not of the same religion, then that is a, uh, it pushes yes. you to, to change. <laughs> dear, dear professors, we are running out of time. Could we please yes. move to the next question? Yes. Uh, Professor Nala, are you ready for your answer? Sir? Sure. Uh, I, have some, I have taken some notes regarding the uh, question. Uh, she is asking, Especially as far as I'm not wrong, uh, if the Ottomans were aware of the uh, Treaty of Tordesillas. Yes, yes. 
uh, even late in even in the later periods. Yeah, I have not coincided with any writings, any literature regarding. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but they are aware of the policy followed by the Portuguese first, and then Spanish. The Ottomans were coincided with the uh, Spanish in the Mediterranean, but Portuguese uh, in the Red Sea uh, and in the uh, Indian coast. Uh, the Ottomans have made four, organized four expeditions during the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent uh, to India, uh, but uh, in the end, uh, they saw that they will be unsuccessful uh, and give up the idea uh, to control the Indian waters. Uh, but they did not give up to control the whole Arabian Peninsula, Hormuz, uh, uh, the, uh, Basra, uh, and Aden, and also Red Sea. Uh, there was not channel at that time in, uh, in Egypt, uh, Suez Channel, but they controlled the uh, Red Sea. Uh, at the beginnings, uh, in your early periods, uh, before Selim I in 1517, uh, especially during the reign of Bayezid II, they yeah. had uh, some ships and materials to construct ships to, to yeah. fight the Portuguese. Uh, so they were not uh, uh, directly uh, fought at the beginning with the Portuguese, but that they indirectly gave some uh, naval uh, material to the uh, mm. the state, but later uh, they have controlled all Arabian Peninsula and they direct the port with the Portuguese. I haven't, as I said before, I haven't coincided any document or any uh, yeah. book about okay. this. Uh, but uh, as far as I can guess, uh, they discuss in the Divan Humayun, uh, the yeah. port. They must have discussed uh, these uh, developments. Uh, in the government. Uh, and as far as we can uh, guess, uh, there are many uh, Jewish uh, consultants in the Ottoman, uh, mm. Ottoman court. So they must have some idea, uh, some opinions about these developments mm. in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, we cannot think that they are unaware of the agreement. Uh, mm. It was not involved in the intellectual uh, historiography. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Alvin. I would uh, like just a moment, uh, yes, please. just yes, one please. or two sentences. Uh, uh, I would like to present in my uh, readings, I tried to show that actually these latecomers, Crotius was not aware of uh, these developments. He is very, his doctrine and principles are very primitive than the other uh, articles in the calculations. He is also resisting the Treaty of Tordesilla mm -hmm. uh, a century later, 120 mm -hmm. years later. Mm -hmm. uh, so he is not setting down new articles, new doctrines also. His, his uh, writings is only uh, resistance uh, yes. in Spanish and Portugal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ms. Yuxan, are you there? Can you hear us? Because I have pending questions. Okay, we will get back to Ms. Yüksel. She is not available at the moment, as I can see. Yes, I guess there is a question to Professor Kasola from uh, Admiral Otoch. Let's hear that, and then we have two more questions for the same speaker. Admiral Otoch, can you hear me, sir? Oh, yes. Do you hear me? Please, yes, yes. Okay, hello again. Uh, Arnold, are you there? Yes, I'm here, I'm here. Uh, I'm very nice glad that you. you you you joined to our uh, uh, symposium. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, this morning I have shown your book. This this is your book. Yeah. You cannot see your screen, sir. You have to share your screen first. Okay. Yes. Arnold, I have shown I your, yeah. your your book uh, this morning. To, to everyone that uh, it is it was really beautiful book generally uh, uh, maybe we all, can have it translated into Turkish <laughs> I, I hope yeah we're gonna do it uh, let me say that after the pandemic and why not we have to uh, uh, make a symposium on uh, uh, 
1565 CA solely in Malta. That, that, that is uh, uh, what I'm thinking uh, because it is right place to do. To me, this, the, the 1565 CA is the turning point of the 16th century. Mm-hmm. And it is very, very important for both sides. What do you what do you think? I mean, uh, do you think maybe uh, Simon Marcella, uh, John Abella from Malta side, and there are some others. Uh, you know, we get together there and do a small symposium. It is, uh, of course, a, su- a suggestion that can be proposed to to the others, but. Uh, uh, well, know, well, knowing a bit more that the, the, the organization and especially the financing and so on, but it's a, it's a proposal that one can maybe, maybe a Malta University. Uh, Car- Carmelo Vassallo was there. I yes, Carmelo Vassallo was here. I, he, I don't know if he's gone back to Spain now. Uh, okay, so let's work on it. I have a, a question to you. Generally, I have been asked several times, even in the Maltese uh, television, what was the main reason? What was the main reason of the CH? Yes. From so, the, there, there are two views. One mm-hmm. is psychological. The, the capture of the myth mother of Mihir yes. that, that story. And uh, Alexandria Bay's capture and that stuff, hatred, but it is not written in the Muhammad Eftalabi. You know, when you were here, yes. you have uh, worked on it. Yes. There is not even single sentence, the reason of the siege from the Ottoman side, but mm-hmm. possibly it was very strategic for the Rome and for the Western part of the Mediterranean. It is some kind of a strategic decision. This is my belief. I don't know. What's your opinion? Is it a psychological reason or strategic reason which Ottomans are trying to diffuse or weigh West and also by way of Sicily to Rome? There are two two views. Okay. This well, is one question to you, and also I have a question for Mrs. A.J. Yuxer, but she's not there, as I understand. Uh, maybe uh, uh, De Janeiro knows the answer, because the, the, the Hadub Suleiman Pasha's ships, uh, Giancarlo Casale was working on it. What type of ships they have built in Suez shipyard? We don't know the types of the ships. Okay, we know the numbers, we know the armament, we know everything, but the types of the ships, uh, Giancarlo Casale couldn't finish that work as I remember. Okay, yes, Arnold, I'm listening to you. Yes. So So, uh, before you start, before you start, can I just cut in here? Actually, we have we have just now finished our time for question and answer period. However, I'm not going to stop it here. We will continue, but I would kindly ask all the speakers to make it as short as possible so that we can move on with this session three. Yeah. Okay. So oh, yes. So I'll try and be very quick. Um, yes, I I will agree with uh, Admiral uh, Metin that. Uh, for me, this, it is the strategic aspect that was the most important. So Suleiman, in his commands, states it clearly when he writes to Hassan Pasha, when he writes also to some other um, uh, uh, Qadi, etc. And he says it clearly. The infidels are obstructing the merchants and the pilgrims coming on this route it's from North Africa, from Maghreb, Mm-hmm. So we have the pilgrims going to Mecca, probably, uh, in the, and the merchants, they were actually disrupting the commerce and the, the trade and uh, free passage in this whole Mediterranean, which is 
ruled by this great man uh, with this great empire, and but having this spot here, which was causing a lot of problems and of trouble. So that is what is in the documents of the era, uh, uh, of the time, on the uh, Ottoman part. Now, in uh, Western, in Western chronicles, a part, a part, this is not really mentioned. And as you said, we have the psychological uh, aspect of Jean Severe, uh, the wetness of Suleiman's of Hurrem Sultana, the, the, the, the, the Mira, Mirima, Mirima Sultan, the daughter of Suleiman. She was her wet nurse and uh, she was very angry and therefore this was, we, this was an affront for the pride of Suleiman and having the ship taken, um, the Grand Sultana was a big dishonor. But also, and this is interesting, with Maltese historians, except for me, do not accept it. The, the, the political aspect that Sicily would be, this Malta would be a stepping stone into Sicily and then Italy eventually. But this is written expressly, one, in Balbi di Correggio, who was fighting in Malta, and he printed his book, his diary, in 1567. So just two years is mentioned by Hippolyto Sanz, 1582, uh, in an epic poem, written the same thing. But recently, I wrote an article uh, in, the, in the Maltese newspaper in the Times of Malta, because there is a new document, which is extremely interesting, by the Pope. Of, uh, the, it's a dialogue of October 24, 1565. So just a, a week, two, three weeks after the end of the siege, where um, Angelo, Pier, there is a, this is a dialogue between Paolo Paruta and Angelo Dolfin from Venice. And they are mentioning amongst the reasons for why one had to act against the Sultan from Venezia was because uh, the great damage it will, be, I'm quoting, uh, the great damage it will be to Christianity if Malta were to be lost. If the Circus Sultan's Armada were installed in Malta, it would cause great damage to Christian shipping. It would be extremely dangerous. And I firmly believe that it could one day conquer Sicily and consequently then obtain unhindered passage into Italy. This is verbatim. It's not me who's saying this. This is October, uh, three weeks after the siege. So we have this, uh, and this document has come out recently through another book, which I was reading, and obviously, which is, rather I can give you the details uh, eventually, I will, uh, by email and whatnot. So uh, yes, I, I would agree, but all Maltese scholars disagree because they say it's not practical, because Sicily is too far away from Vienna. Professor Castola, I have two quick questions from uh, Dr. Demirel for you about Malta again. Uh, his questions are, he is asking if Malta has ever been blockaded by Germans during the First and Second World War. This is question oh. one from Mr. Demirel. And uh, his second question is, he asks if Malta has been sieged before by Carthaginians or, or Romans. Two questions. Well, for the for the first question, yes. Malta is the most bombarded place in the Second World War. And it is exactly for the same reason as Suleiman. What was happening was during the Second World War, all the Axis forces, Germany, Italy, etc., had all the Mediterranean, all, this time even Italy, Albania, Greece, uh, North Africa, and there was Rommel in, uh, in Africa, in, in, in Tobruk, in Libya, and in Malta was the only place that was destroying 50% of the um, uh, shipping of the, of the weapons that were being taken to Africa for Rommel. So that is why um, then Hitler decided really to bombard Malta, and it was a two year where uh, Malta used to be bombarded even six times a day. So our parents, my parents, there was no, they used to eat cats. <laughs> there was no food. And uh, we were saved just 
uh, after after two years by a convoy which arrived at the last minute when the island was totally out of food. And of course, Malta has always been uh, dominated by because of its position, but in history by Carthaginians, by the Romans for 400 years, 450 years, by the Arabs uh, between 890, uh, 1090, and then, and basically they all came via Sicilia. So it was not that the Arabs would attack Malta from Tunisia, they come to Malta directly. First they take Palermo in Sicily, and then Malta was considered to be a periphery of Sicilia. So they would come down to, to Malta 30, 40 years later, and then the Normans, the Swabians, all the, and we, until 1530, until the night of St. John, Malta was a part of the Sicilian feudal system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Pleasure. Tosola. Very enlightening. Thank you. We are already eight, nine minutes due time, but I, just to be fair, I cannot miss uh, Ms. Yuxel's answer to Professor Krupa. If Ms. Yuxel is here, I saw her written answer on the chat box, but if she wants to answer the question about helping uh, in the Suez area, if she is here, she can answer Ms. Uh, Professor Krupa's question. Ms. Yuxel, are you here at the moment? Okay. Uh, Professor Kuto, do you want to know what she says as an answer to your question? Because she has written it in the chat box. Do you have that? Okay. So I will have to stop here for this question and answer period. Uh, now we will proceed with third and final session. I am handing over to Ms. Songer as she will be running the third session. Yes, Ms. Songer, you have the floor. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Shuhmantepe. Uh, okay, hello again. Uh, now we are on the third and the last session of today's um, International Symposium on the Eastern Mediterranean Maritime History. We have uh, two speakers now. The first speaker will be the Assistant Professor Dr. Recep Kürekli, and the second speaker will be Mrs. Jamie Yağmur. Each participant will have 20 minutes, as it was the case before, and I will be giving notification uh, when you have two minutes left. After presentation, we will be continuing again, like uh, it was the case before, uh, question and answers. We will take each questions by written format, and I will be directing you the question, or we will see how it goes uh, now. Uh, I will give the floor to Dr. Recep Kürekli. He is an assistant professor in Nevşehir Hacı Bektaş Veli University. Mr. Kürekli will be making his presentation on the following topic in the Eastern Mediterranean Basin combating again, uh, against hashish smuggling in the case of Egypt and Tripoli provinces in the late Ottoman period, 1850 to 1914. Uh, his presentation uh, will be in English. However, he will be delivering his speech in Turkish. Thank you. Hello. All participants, can you hear me? We can. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the members of Symposium Organization and Science Committee, and especially uh, Applying Director of Maritime History Resource Center uh, Mr. Mrs. Uh, Funda Songur uh, and to other participants. I will present my presentation in Turkish, uh, but my PowerPoint presentation will be in, in English for participants who don't know uh, Turkish. Uh, thank you in advance uh, for your understanding. Okay. Funda Hanım, ekran paylaşımı için yetki verdiniz mi? Evet, verilmiş tamam. olması lazım. Tamam, şu anda başlıyorum. Evet, gözüküyor mu? Evet, gözüküyor. Teşekkür ediyorum. Benim sunumum Doğu Akdeniz Havzası'nda haşhaş veya uyuşturucu kaçakçılığıyla mücadele başlığı altında. Burada 
durum olarak e, Mısır ve e, Trablus, Bingazi e, eyaletleri e, Osmanlı'nın son döneminde e, ele alınacak. Onun üzerinde değerlendireceğim. E, 19. yüzyılın ikinci yarısı ve 20. yüzyılın ilk çeyreğinde 1. Dünya Savaşı'na kadarki dönem e, anlatacağımız konular arasında. E, burada e, ba, e, spesifik olarak, tematik olarak bahsedeceğimiz şey haşhaş kaçakçılığı. Fakat e, sunumun başında ilk olarak değineceğim şey Doğu Akdeniz Havzası'nın önemi. E, tarihi açıdan buranın neden e, önem arz ettiği ve hangi güçlerin burada e, etkin olmaya çalıştığı politik ve ekonomik açılardan. Daha sonra e, özellikle süreç kanalının açılmasıyla beraber bu bölgede hareketliliğin artması, e, gemi ticareti ve yine uluslararası rekabet artmasına dayanan bazı veriler kullanacağım. Özellikle e, İngiliz arşivi burada e, bize ana kaynak teşkil edecek. E, onun akabinde bununla ilgili e, yapılan mücadele, mücadele yöntemleri, hangi güzergahlar kullanılarak e, kaçakçılık yapılıyor, kimler bu işte e, aracı oluyorlar, Bürokrasinin içerisinde bu işle uğraşanlar var mı? Bununla ilgili yapılan düzenlemeler, alınan kararlar e, ve e, netice alınabilmiş mi? Bununla ilgili hangi birimler e, faaliyet gösteriyor? Bu e, haşhaş kaçakçılığı ve diğer e, kaçak malların e, engellenmesiyle alakalı. Onlara e, değinmeye çalışacağım hızlı bir şekilde. Öncelikle Doğu Akdeniz Havzası e, ekonomik ve Politik açıdan tarihi, aç- tarihi boyunca e, önem arz eden, önemli korunmuş bir e, coğrafya. Bilindiği gibi coğrafi keşiflerin e, etkisiyle beraber yeni yolların bulunmasıyla göreceli olarak e, önemini kaybetmiş gibi gözüküyor. Çünkü yeni ticari yollar Avrupa'nın kullandığı yeni yollar onlar için daha avantajlı hale e, gelmişti. E, fakat e, 1869 yılında Süveyş Kanalı'nın tekrardan açılmasıyla beraber ee, Doğu Akdeniz Havzası tekrar önem kazanıyor. Doğu Akdeniz'le beraber tabii Kızıldeniz ve Hint Okyanusu'na giden güzergah. Ee, yine e, Avrupa ile Uzak Doğu arasındaki ticari yollarında e, tekrardan değiştiğini ifade edebiliriz. Ee, burada tarihi açıdan birçok gücün bu bölgeye e, hakim olması e, hakim olmak için e, politik açıdan, siyasi açıdan e, mücadele verdiklerini biliyoruz. Birçok e, e, savaşların yaşandığını biliyoruz. Önceki sunumlarda da bunu gördük. Bu havzaya hakim olmak isteyen güçlerin verdikleri mücadeleleri. E, dolayısıyla e, bizim e, konumuz olan kısım daha orta çağ veya ilk çağlar değil ama daha sonraki 19. yüzyıl e, kısmı. Bu dönemde de e, dünyanın en büyük e, deniz kuvvetine sahip olan İngilizler e, bu bölgeye e, önem veriyorlar. Tabii e, 7 yıl savaşlarında yine e, Fransa ile bir mücadele verilmişti ve Fransa e, 7 yıl savaşlarında da İngilizler tarafından yer alınca artık dünya hakimiyeti ve dünya denizlerine e, egemen olan güç olarak e, İngiltere ortaya çıkmıştı. İngiliz kraliyet yolu denilen güzergah da bu hat üzerinde olduğu için e, İngiltere ve Fransa arasında e, rekabetin arttığını söyleyebiliriz. Yine aynı şekilde sanayi devriminden sonra ee, endüstri, endüstrileşmesini hızlandıran Almanya'da bu yarışa girecek. Ee, biz Süveyş Kanalı açıldıktan sonra burada gemilerin e, adetleri ve tonajlarını e, gösteren tablomuz var. O tabloda da e, Almanya'nın da bu bölgede etkin bir faaliyet gösterdiğini görüyoruz. Özellikle, özellikle bildiğim Kaiser'in 2. Abdülhamit döneminde Filistin coğrafyasına yöneldiğini ve bir ver politik izlediğini biliyoruz. Ama e, bölgede etkin olan kuvvet İngilizlerdir diyebiliriz. Kıbrıs'ın alınması, yine Mısır'ın e, 1882'de ele geçirilmesi vesaire e, bunların göstergesidir diyebiliriz. Yine e, bölgenin canlanmasında etkili olan şeylerden birisi teknolojik devrimiyle beraber e, buharın e, gemilerde kullanılmaya başlaması çok önemli bir e, çığır açmıştır. Büyük vapurların yapılması, işte kazanlarının daha dayanıklı olmasıyla beraber gemilerin ağırlıkları, kapasiteleri, tonajları, hızları büyük bir artış göstermiştir. Özellikle 19. yüzyılın ikinci yarısında. Dünya ekonomisinde Doğu Akdeniz'in şehirlerinin de bu bağlamda önem kazandığını 
ekonomik açıdan da e, pik yaptıklarını e, ifade edebiliriz küresel bağlamda. Yine aynı şekilde gelirlerinde de muazzam bir artış e, yaşanıyor ve buradaki belki bir bal, balıkçı kasabası formatındaki bazı e, şehirlerin, e, Doğu Akdeniz liman şehirlerinin e, girişimciler tarafından e, ihya edildiğini e, ve e, bugünkü modern e, şehirlerin endüstrileşmiş şehirlerine e, dönüşmeye başladığını e, ifade edebiliriz. E, Fransa, Almanya ve İngiltere'nin bu bölgede güç mücadelesi e, verdiğini ifade etmiştik. Yine aynı şekilde uluslararası ticaret hacminin de bu bölgede canlanmasına e, bu süreç içerisinde anlattığımız şeyler katkı sunmuştur. Sonuç olarak da e, gemi trafiğinde e, dramatik bir şekilde bir artıştan bahsedebiliriz. Yine e, İngiliz arşivinden aldığımız bir e, kaynağa bakacak olursak, burada 1869 ve 1900 yılları arasında Süveyş kanalından geçen gemilerin e, adetleri, gross tonajları, net tonajlarını gösteren e, bir tablo. E, süreç içinde bakacak olursak ondan başlayıp 486, 765 bin civarında giderken e, 20. yüzyılın başına gelindiğinde 1300, e, pardon 3500, 3600'lere e, geldiğini görüyoruz adet olarak. Tonaj olarak da yine aynı şekilde e, 10 bin kilodan 13 milyon kiloya buradaki e, geçen gemilerin toplam tonajının e, ulaştığını görüyoruz. Bu da bölgedeki hareketliliğin e, bir göstergesi. Yine aynı şekilde e, Süreyş kanalını kullanan çeşitli milletlerin e, gemi oranları, yine tonajları yıllara göre verilmiş. 1895, 96 ve 97 e, yıllarına ait veriler elimizde. E, birinci sırada biraz önce de ifade ettiğimiz gibi 19. yüzyılın en büyük deniz filosuna sahip olan İngiltere e, Boğazı Süveyş kanalını e, en çok kullanan e, devlet olarak karşımıza çıkıyor. İkinci sırada Almanya, üçüncü sırada Fransa e, ve bunu da e, daha çok e, Avrupalı devletler takip ediyor diyebiliriz. 19. yüzyılı şimdi e, spesifik olarak uyuşturucu kaçakçılığı konusu, kaçakmanlar konusuna gelecek olursak bunlarla yapılan mücadele bağlamında 19. yüzyılın başından itibaren Mısır hükümetinin e, kenevir üretimini, e, uyuşturucu ekiminde kullanılacak ekinlerin üretimini engelleyici, sınırlandırıcı faaliyetler içerisine girdiğini biliyoruz. E, hem şehirlerde hem kırsal kesimde artan bir şekilde kontrollerini sağlamışlardı. E, bu işle kimler uğra uğraşıyor, kimler satıyor, kimler aracılık ediyor, e, bu tür girişimlerin e, ortadan kaldırılması için e, düzenlemeler yapıyorlardı. Yine 1880 yılında resmi bir e, kararname ile e, Mısır'da, e, Mısır e, bölgesinde e, uyuşturucu ekimi yasaklanmıştı. Yine aynı şekilde bununla uğraşanlar tespit ediliyor, yakalanıyor, elde edilen ürünler ortadan kaldırılıyordu. Sonuç olarak e, bunların takip edilmesi ve yok edilmesi ile ilgili e, makamlar e, sahil güvenlik, polis teşkilatı, e, gümrük birimlerindeki, gümrük idaresindeki e, çeşitli birimler ellerinden gelen gayreti gösteriyor. Fakat burada şunu ifade edebiliriz ki e, ellerinden gelen gayreti göstermelerine rağmen e, 20. yüzyılın ilk çeyreğine ulaştığımız zamanda bile tam anlamıyla bu işin ortadan kalkmadığını e, bugün bile bu şekilde bu faaliyetler devam ediyor. E, faaliyetlerini sürdürdüklerini e, bu e, kaçak malları temin etmek isteyenlerin bir şekilde bu e, materyallere ulaşmasının mümkün olduğunu ifade edebiliriz. Yine aynı şekilde e, 1882 yılında İngiltere'nin Mısır'ı e, işgal ettiği dönemde bile bu e, e, uyuşturucu ekimi ile ilgili yasak e, yürürlükteydi. Birçok e, insanın buna bağımlı olduğunu e, belgelerden e, tespit ediyoruz. E, bu iş e, bakıldığı zaman mesela belli bir kar da getiriyor. Yani bu kaçakçılık işiyle uğraşanlar e, açısından. E, bu rakamların e, arttığını da görüyoruz. Yani mesela e, 7-8 frank olan okkabaşı e, uyuşturucunun e, bedeli işte taşıma, nakliye e, muhtemelen verilen rüşvetler ve taşıma maliyetleriyle beraber 12-14 franka çıktı ve satış 
aşamasında da 22-24 franka kadar çıktığını ifade edebiliriz. E, bu rakam e, mı dikkate aldığımızda aşağı yukarı e, okka başına e, 20 franktan e, daha az kar elde etmiyorlar. Diğer bir de işte yüzde 85'ten az kar etmediklerini görüyoruz bu kaçakçıların. Fakat bu e, 40-45 frank e, ortalama e, bedeli zaman içerisinde 100-110 franka kadar e, çıktığı da oluyor. E, şimdi burada e, Mısır'ın kuzeyi ile e, Tripoli veya e, Bingazi diyebileceğimiz e, Libya diyebileceğimiz bugünkü bölge arası e, çok geniş bir coğrafya fakat alt kısmı e, çöllerden oluşuyor. Dolayısıyla burası seyyahlar tarafından çok fazla kullanılmıyor. E, 20-30 gün civarında develerle geçirebilen işte vahaların e, çok geniş vahaların ve çöllerin olduğu e, bir e, coğrafya e, burası. E, kaçakçılar da daha çok burayı kullanıyorlar. İlerleyen zamanlarda bu bölgeyi de etkin kullanabilmek için Abbas Hilmi Paşa e, zamanında Mısır Hidivi e, bir tren yolu projesi var ve bu tren yolu projesi planlanıyor ve büyük ölçüde hayata geçiriliyor. Yine bunların üzerinde belli güzel, e, belli noktalara da e, deve birlikleri konuluyor. Bu bölgedeki bedevilerin e, bu kaçakçılık faaliyetlerini ve diğer kaçakçılık veya asayiş problemlerini çözmek için. E, bu projeyi şu şekilde e, gösterebiliriz. E, sayın hocalarım e, İskenderiye'nin batısından e, Tripoli'ye, Trablus Karpa kadar uzanan bir coğrafya. Çeşitli aralıklarla istasyonlar inşa ediliyor. Bazı ara istasyonlar var e, ve ana istasyonlar var. E, bu istasyonlarda hem e, buradaki ticaret kontrol altına alınacak hem de sahil boyunca ve çölden gelebilecek herhangi bir e, sıkıntılı durum önlenmeye çalışılacak. Ee, burada çeşitli rakamlar var. Mesela 1898 yılında ele, İskenderiye sahil güvenliği tarafından İskenderiye civarında ele geçirilen 10.120 kiloluk bir uyuşturucu var. Ee, yine aynı şekilde e, İskenderiye ve e, Tripoli yani Trablus limanlarından 240 mil e, uzaktaki bölgede e, istasyonların e, kurulduğunu, yani bu hattın 240 mil e, sürdüğünü e, ifade edebiliriz. Bu bölgede daha çok göçebe Arapların yaşadığı ifade ediliyor. E, biraz önce de ifade ettiğim gibi hükümetlerin e, uyuşturucu kaçakçılığını önlemek için almış olduğu büyük tedbirlere rağmen e, yani bu karlı ticari tam anlamıyla e, ortadan kaldırmak imkansızdır gibi değerlendirmeler yapılıyor. Ve e, İskenderi'nin batısında 120, 120 mil batısında Mersa Metruk civarında da e, kontrol noktası e, develi birliklerden oluşan kontrol noktasının kurulduğunu da ifade edebiliriz. E, biraz önceki anlattığım durum işte Bedevilerin liman e, sahili kullanarak arkasındaki çölün vasıtasıyla e, uyuşturucu pazarlarına işte marketlere bunu e, ulaştırabilmek için e, bu arayı kullandıklarını yoğunlukla kullandıklarını ifade edebilir. Bununla ilgili bir görsel e, olarak bunu paylaşabilirim. E, açıkta bekleyen bazen vapurlu, bazen yelkenli gemilerin e, uyuşturucuları e, verebilmek için aşağı yukarı 40, mil, e, 40 e, metre veya da biraz daha fazla açıkta e, bekleyip daha sonra gün a, gün a, e, batınca hızlı bir şekilde e, sahile gelip yükünü bırakması veya buradan yükünü alması yine farklı güzergahlara götürmesi söz konusu oluyor. Bununla ilgili faaliyetlerde bulunan e, göçe ve bedevilerle ilgili e, bir görsel. E, İskenderiye'nin e, batı Alex, e, İskenderi'nin batı sahilleriyle e, Trablus arasında e, Süveyş kanalında ve Körfez'de e, çok sayıda e, uyuşturucu merkezinin olduğunu ifade edebiliriz. Bu bölgede yapılan devriyelerde yine e, çok sayıda e, çok miktarda diyelim e, uyuşturucunun ele geçirildiğini e, görebiliriz. Bununla ilgili e, sunumun sonuna doğru toplu bir e, tablo vereceğim. Aşağı yukarı 
e, yıllık 20 bin kilo civarında e, uyuşturucu e, maddenin ele geçirildiğini burada görüyoruz. E, Libya çöllerinden bile yine aynı şekilde İskenderi'ye yanı sıra Mingazi'ye e, bu uyuşturucular e, taşınıyor diyebiliriz. Uyuşturucunun e, ana kaynaklarından e, bahsedecek olursak, yani burada birinci derecede Yunan, e, Yunanistan e, bu işi yapıyor. Gerek açık yollarla kendi iç tüketimi için, gerekse ihraç etmek için açıktan veya e, gizli bir şekilde bu üretimi yapıyorlar. Bu yasal olarak e, o dönem için e, Yunanistan'da mümkün. E, 1850'lerden sonra bu faaliyetler artırdıklarını ifade edebiliriz. Mısır'ın kuzeyinde büyük çöllere yine bu e, uyuşturucuyu gönderiyorlar. E, kaçakçılar Lübnan'dan, Filistin'den ve özellikle e, Yunanistan'dan e, bu güzergahı kullanarak veya da e, devriyenin olmadığı sahilleri kullanarak bu e, noktada avantaj elde ediyorlar ve ürünlerini buradan e, işbirlikçilerine taşıyorlar. Tabi işbirlikçiler arasında sadece bedeliler yok. Bazen mesela e, kale komutanları da bu işte aracılık ediyorlar. E, kale duvarlarının dibine bırakılan e, paketler komutan ve adamları e, tarafından e, temin ediliyor. Bununla ilgili e, Faros Kalesi ve e, komutanı Hüseyin Bey e, Bey'in e, bu işi yaptığı, kardeşinin de bu işe bulaştığı e, belgelere yansımış. Hocam e, e, iki dakikamız kaldı. Öyle mi? Tamam. Evet. Hızlı bir şekilde geçiyorum o zaman. Evet. Burada yine e, rakamlar var. Şunu ifade edebilirim. İskenderiye ile e, bu e, güzergah üzerindeki e, denetim noktalarına bakacak olursak e, 14 civarında e, istekli kontrol, e, denetim yapacak kontrol noktası ve önleyici kontrol noktasının kurulduğunu ifade edebiliriz. Rakamlarda. Yine aynı şekilde e, İskend e, İskenderiye'nin batısında ve doğusunda yüzlerce millik alanda e, sistematik olarak e, sahil güvenlik kontrollerinin, devriyelerinin e, hareket ettiğini görebiliriz burada. E, İskenderiye, Raşit, Kimyat, Borsaid, e, uyuşturucu kaçakçılığı yapılan bölgeler e, ülkeye girmesini engellemek için bu bölgede kontrollerin yapıldığını ifade edebiliriz. E, kaçakçıların e, devlet görevlilerinin yapmış olduğu müdahaleye rağmen e, veya onların çalışmalarını engellemeye yönelik yapmış oldukları e, girişimleri e, hemen e, aşarak yeni bir yol bulduklarından da bahsediliyor. Dolayısıyla e, kaçakçıların e, zekaları ve kararlılıklarıyla mücadele edebilmek için de e, sağlam bir e, yönetim e, ve idarenin olması gerektiğinden de bahsediliyor. Burada rakamlar var. Bu rakamları toplu olarak vereyim. Yine aynı şekilde şu var. Rüşvet konusu çok önemli. Rüşvet arttığı için kaçakçılar yanlarında bir miktarda nakit para bulunduruyorlar. Yakalandıkları zaman bunu devlet görevlilerine vererek bu tutuklanmadan kurtuluyorlar diyebiliriz. Yine gemilerin içerisinde piyanoya, piyanonun ayaklarına, Çeşitli fındık kabukları içerisine, şişelere, e, bazen hamile kadın e, şeklinde bugün de belki hani e, havalimanlarında rastladığımız ayakkabı altlarına, e, şapkalara e, uyuşturucu koyul koyularak da uyuşturucu e, kaçırıldığı e, ifade ediliyor. Bunlar e, belgelere yansımış. E, daha öncesinde hükümet tarafından verilen... E, Ödüller varmış e, Mısır hükümeti tarafından kaçakçıların, yakala, kaçakçıların yakalanmasına değil. E, bu e, uygulama da zamanla kalktığı için e, kaçak malların ülke içerisinde e, arttığını e, ifade edebiliriz. Yani bu e, kaçakçılığı önlemek için e, olumlu bir e, adımmış. E, biraz önce bahsettiğim e, Faros e, Kalesi Komutanı e, Hüseyin Bey'in ee, Yunan asıllı e, bu kaçakçılık işinde kardeşiyle beraber e, faaliyet gösterdiğini de ifade edebiliriz. İşte duvarın dibine indirilen e, ürünleri alıp e, iç piyasaya dağıtıyorlar. 
E, İngiltere'nin işgalinden sonra e, kurulan bazı birlikler var. Bu birliklerin başındaki Morris Bey'in e, çöllerde e, çeşitli hatta böyle canını e, delik yapacak şekilde çatışmalara girdiğinden e, bahsediliyor. İngiliz e, konsolosu, e, baş konsolosu Erin Berry'nin e, ifade ettiği şey e, her ne kadar elimizden gelen gayreti göstersek de bu işi tam anlamıyla ortadan kaldıramayız diye olayın büyüklüğünü anlattığı bir ifadede söz konusu bu ifade edilmiş. E, bu rakamları vermeyeceğim. Şurada toplu olarak bunu göstereyim. 1900'den 1913'e kadar e, sahil güvenliği e, gümrük idaresine ve polisin e, ele geçirmiş olduğu e, uyuşturucu miktarı aşağı yukarı 205 bin e, kilo civarında e, yaklaşık her e, yıla 20 bin kilo civarında uyuşturucu e, yakalanmış. Doktor Greg, we have to uh, conclude your speech. <gülüyor> okay, okay. <gülüyor> Thank you. I am finishing. Ee, şunu ifade edebiliriz e, hızlı bir şekilde. Yıllarca verilen mücadeleye rağmen e, yılda işte biraz önce de ifade ettim 20 bin kiloluk e, haşhaş e, ele geçirilmesine rağmen e, Mısır'ın ve e, Trablus Karp'ın e, bütün köylerinde uygun fiyata e, haşhaşa, uyuşturucuya ulaşabildiklerine e, ifade ediyor belgeler. Ben ulaştığımız e, sonuç. Teşekkür ediyorum. Biz teşekkür ederiz. E, Doktor Kürekli, thank you for your contributions. Now uh, I would like to call our second speaker, Mrs. Cemile Yağmur. She is a PhD candidate in RGS University. Mrs. Yağmur will be making uh, her presentation on the following topic. Activities of Antant states from the Mediterranean to the Strait in the national struggle. The floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. But your voice is uh, now muted. Sesinizi açabilir misiniz? Your voice. Yes, now okay. Uh, we we can't hear you yet. Uh, no, we can't hear. No, we can't. Uh, there might be some problem about the connection. We will wait for a couple of minutes. In the meantime, until Mrs. Yağmur comes back, uh, I can ask for our guests and uh, distinguished participants to direct their questions about Dr. Kürekli uh, by writing the questions in the chat box. Uh, so far, I have not received any questions. Yes, I think there is a problem, a connection problem. Please bear with us. I would have a question. In the meantime, uh, for our speaker, uh, because it's very interesting, you was talking about this period. But what about uh, a closer a period on the Second World War? because I had been in Egypt in the 80s, and I heard that uh, the, this area from Marsa Matru, uh, so west from Alexandria, was still an area of smuggling. Uh, so are these, these uh, connections, smuggling connections, uh, still um, working? Uh, during the Second World War and after, what is the tradition on, on, on the area? Uh, Dr. Kürekli, can you answer the question? 
or you can answer after uh, our presentation if you wish. Um, well, I don't, is... hear, I don't hear him. Uh, ah. Hanım, merhaba. Uh, tekrar edelim mi? Sevinirim. Tam uh, algılayamadım. Kesintiler oldu. Okay, can you please ask your question again? Yeah, my question was if the tradition of smuggling in this area from Marsamatru in, in, in Egypt on the coast from Alexandria was still uh, existing and going on uh, after the period you treated in your presentation. Uh, namely, in, during the Second World War. If there was still a drugs connection in the in the in the area, uh, I have some documents. Uh, the period of the, uh, until the first uh, World War First. Yes. Uh, I don't know after this uh, what's okay. what happened. Uh, I don't know anything about. Uh, but you have for the First World War. Yes. Uh, until the uh, First World uh, War. War. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now, uh, Mrs. Yamur is here. I think you will be able to talk. Uh, your microphone is okay, I, I guess. Uh, no, we can't hear you. Uh, no, we can't. Uh, okay. We will be waiting for we will be waiting for one minute. Uh, maybe you will solve it. We are waiting for you. One minute. Uh -huh. While we are waiting, I would like to ask again if there is any question for Dr. Kirekli. Okay, I see. I think Demir, I would, would like to ask a question. Uh, if you have not written your question, uh, you can ask directly right now. Uh, we can't hear you. Your voice is muted. Your mic, yes, now okay. okay. Now, uh, I would like to uh, respond to question asked by Professor Kuto, Koto. Uh, to Recep Kürekli. Uh, the point is that there are three sea entrance of the Mediterranean Sea. One of them is the Turkish Straits, the other one is the Suez Channel and uh, Suez Canal and uh, uh, as you know the Gibraltar. And uh, Gibraltar uh, are considered international waters. But uh, Suez and the Turkish Straits are not international waters. These waters, in these waters, there are a different type of policy. And normally, in order not to create any problem, political problem, for uh, drug, uh, uh, uh, for the drug issue, or, there is no intention of the Egypt to make an intervention in the Suez Canal and the same for Turkey. And the Turkish policy is, do not, is that no interaction, uh, no intervention against the uh, uh, drug sm uh, smuggling in the Turkish Straits. But uh, we can make this operation in the approaches of the Straits from south or north. And the same thing for the Egypt is uh, valid. That is the situation, the existing situation. There are some political <coughs> political sensitivities. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will ask again if Mrs. Yamur would be able to talk with us. <coughs> I think the problem would be not solved. Or?
she cannot connect. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay, I, I guess it, the problem is the connection problem because of our participants' computer. Uh, we will not be able to talk with Mrs. Jamile Yamur right now, I see. Um, we still have little time. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to ask if there is any further questions to Dr. Kürekli. Okay, as you know, uh, this uh, symposium is going online and we are always having problem uh, due to technical issues. Uh, but please still, uh, we, we, we will wait a little longer. Uh, still, I would like to ask to bear with us for a little longer. According to our program, uh, we would be continuing to final remarks. Uh, we are almost going to finish. If we can be sure about our last presenter, if she would not be able to go further, we will move on to a closing remark. Uh, and I will kindly ask uh, for Admiral Metin Ataj for his remarks. Um, I see that she is still not able to connect. Okay, she's going to be on. Hang on a second, please. Can you please uh, unmute you, your microphone? No, I think there is no, not the problem couldn't be solved as I see. Okay, I would be, uh, I am asking our IT manager. Uh, one second, she's trying to connect. Okay, thank you. We are still having time uh, because according to our program, uh, our final session, which is that we are in, the third session, uh, should be finalized by half past four. Now it is um, quarter past four. We will be seeing if the uh, speaker would be able to convey her, uh, her uh, knowledge to us. Okay. Can we talk, do you think? Mrs. Yamur? Okay. I think we will not be able to uh, move on. Therefore, I should, uh, I am so sorry, but we have to close uh, this trial. We have been trying for more than six, seven minutes, I believe. Uh, now I would like to thank to all contributors one, once more. Uh, I think until the end of the symposium, we will not be finishing to, of course, thank to our contributors. Uh, before closing the program, of course, I kindly ask to Admiral Metin Ataj for uh, the closing remarks. Dear Admiral Ataj, please. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? <clears throat> yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, it's, it's been a long day. Uh, but I think uh, the, the, the, uh, our boutique symposium uh, really became uh, the most fruitful one. This is uh, uh, my perception as I understand. Uh, as we started the uh, 
symposium. Of course, we started our with our uh, esteemed director, Professor Oral Erdogan. He's the architect uh, of this symposium. He even declared mobilization against all the problems to cope up with the problems. Uh, and, and really, uh, we didn't have any uh, big problem during the preparation phase and the execution phase. And our, also our supporter was Mr. Tamer Kran. He really supported us by heart. Uh, so I would like to uh, thank them uh, when I start my speech. <coughs> um, Professor Erdogan, is the uh, uh, is from a Mediterranean area boy. He was raised there, so he has extra interest uh, to the Mediterranean area, and so he uh, really enjoyed, as I understand, by participating in this uh, symposium and. Mr. Uh, Tamer Kran really uh, explained the importance of the Eastern Mediterranean for Turks uh, and the, uh, how important is that to look at the history on the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, among the eight passages, uh, the importance of Suez, Suez Canal, which is a vital role in the Eastern Mediterranean. And also what I found interesting, what he said that increasing population also causes increased cultural interest. This is what I didn't think before. So as I understand, this is one of the key issue we have to look in the future uh, uh, our meetings. Of course, we had the uh, very important uh, keynotes. Dejanera Kuto is, uh, is a good friend of mine. She really uh, uh, did a very good job by giving us uh, interesting and informative information during his keynote speech, her keynote speech. Uh, and he gave us uh, good news about the uh, proceedings for the uh, for our Congress of uh, History of Shipbuilding, and uh, she said that it's uh, the proceeding is about to complete very soon, and it's going to be a marvelous book, which we proudly introduced to the maritime history world, uh, and also he gave us a lot of. Uh, uh, books names, writers, uh, his, his, her speech was full of information, really I enjoyed, and I learned a lot of things. The, the, the, the, the, the interesting one was the uh, Constantine, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, I, I, Constantine Mehmet, I didn't hear it, I didn't heard about it before, so this type of, that was the uh, uh, Syracuse uh, CH. So these things, which I learned from her uh, speech. Of course, uh, Simon Panargenti, uh, Viceroy Palace, Naples, uh, Ripaldo Castel Lecce, uh, Dragut, Gerbe, Malta, uh, and also uh, a lot of uh, information, even concerning crucial for geography. Uh, this is really, I enjoyed very much from her keynote. She, she's been uh, our uh, scientific committee member uh, since 2012, but I know her before, even when I was 
in the service. I uh, knew her. She always, she's been very helpful for us in each area. Whenever we ask anything, she immediately responds and she immediately uh, uh, helps to us. So uh, thank you very much to Dejanela Tutlo for his wonderful, for her wonderful uh, speech. It's my uh, pleasure. Uh, you, you, hear, you hear me, Dejanela? Yes, yes, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. You know, I will do my, I do my best. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, of course, after him, Professor Ali Denizli, uh, he, he gave a really a patriotic uh, uh, type of uh, presentation. Uh, he, even if he's an army officer, I, I like I like his words concerning the Navy. Uh, lose of the naval power uh, caused the weakness of Ottomans. This is something which naval officers should say, but even if he's from army, I really enjoy uh, when he uh, said this. And of course, uh, he talked about Navarian uh, Sinop raids and uh, the, the, the, the corruption period of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I really enjoy what he said during his speech. And also Ulvi Kesar from Cyprus, he brought us to the Cyprus weather, uh, the intelligence activities Eastern Mediterranean was very interesting. He gave us a lot of information concerning the, uh, the British Bureau, even intelligence bureau in the, uh, in the uh, Cyprus, uh, that was, very valuable details which we learned from this speech. And also the French aircraft carriers used for intelligence purposes uh, and also uh, French Legion of Orient camp in Cyprus in 1915. These information which I found real valuable. My friend Ergun Demirel He's a strategist. Uh, he, he gave us very important and very good coverage of the strategy and starting from the history and he brought it up to our time really. And he described how Turks penetrated from Anatolia to the West starting from the 11th century. And he uh, elaborated that story very intelligently, very skillfully. So I congratulate him for his very good uh, presentation. And we learned uh, also the, the Limni captured by, uh, by amphibious operations. And we know that Ottomans give great importance to the amphibious operation. Uh, even at the beginning of Ottomans, they think that Navy is for to carry the, only the soldiers, the emissaries. But after uh, Fatih Sultan Mehmet the Conqueror, Navy become Navy. He is the first uh, Sultan who gave importance to the Navy. So we learned the tactics of uh, piracy, hit and run. These are very interesting terms which as in strategic way we should hear. And he described command at sea, sea control, sea denial matters. These are very familiar. And also uh, the, the, the words of Fritz Neumark, the, the, the, the words were very interesting. If you remove Turks from history, there is no history. Okay, uh, I, I buy that. Uh, but you cannot disappear Turks. I mean, uh, uh, and maybe uh, he's right. Turks never been a maritime uh, nation. Uh, I, I, I, I, I, I don't agree. Uh, okay, questions and answers period. Uh, let me wrap up very quickly. Uh, 
uh, the, the, the question of importance of capturing Cyprus is very interesting. And uh, of, also the, the compare, comparison of Admiral, Admiral Doria and Pirate Barbarossa, because we sometimes uh, say Barbarossa was like Francis Drake or Sir Raleigh. Uh, and also during the questions and answers period, uh, uh, Greek contributed philosophy, Rome contributed law. These are uh, good things. In the afternoon, of course, Blant Chazer, uh, he, uh, he elaborated Mediterranean very well. And he, um, he even described, first time I heard this term, liquid continent, between three continents, Mediterranean, is a liquid continent, he described. Uh, I think we should look at the subject by way of his point of view. And uh, he said that the Mediterranean for years uh, connected the three continents, of course. And he talked about the importance of Egypt, Rome, and Ottoman Empire. And he uh, finished up his uh, speech uh, or, or the words, with the words of Antonius Pius, Lord of the world. Law is the sea, Lord of the sea. You know, the, the two different terms. I like, really like that. After him, uh, my good friend Arnold Casola, he, uh, because I, I read his book, I know uh, he has written all the things about the uh, uh, 16, uh, 1565 siege. And he uh, really, uh, uh, month by month, he moved the Ottoman fleet from Sublime Port from Istanbul up to Malta. Uh, and he described every step, every uh, uh, port they stopped and they did whatever they did, uh, I really uh, like it very much. But as I told you, uh, Malta uh, as a case uh, should be taken as a separate symposium. This is very important because the turning point of the 16th century is the Malta siege. So I said, maybe in Turkey or in Malta, we should solely uh, make a symposium on Malta, maybe in our universe. I, I know Professor Idris Bosta is also the member of our scientific committee. Uh, he thinks that way. Uh, we should uh, talk about Malta, only Malta. The, the, the sea passage, the CH part, the operation in the island, and the withdrawal of the Turkish forces. We don't know a lot of things during the withdrawal. The Ottoman Navy divided into two, Mustafa Pasha and Piala Pasha. Why they have separated their forces. Akif Abdul, who is a prominent uh, academician, he was trying to find out some Ruzname about that. But uh, I didn't, here, I didn't know that he found that uh, documents, historical documents from the Ottoman side. There are a lot of unknowns, unknowns about this part. So I really thank you very much, Arnold. Uh, he really helped us uh, today. And Blant, Blant, or Professor Blant, or is a good friend of us. Uh, he, he made a very interesting uh, presentation uh, with, in connection with Hugo Grotius. Am I not right, Glenn? Uh, and he, he, had, uh, he has given good descriptions about the flag nations and demarcation lines and the questions of uh, De Genera, uh, 
50 documents, no demarcation lines afterwards. But as far as I know, in this Peter race map, uh, he doesn't say clearly, but he give the impression of demarcation line. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But in, in, in, on the map, is, he gives some kind of a indication that Peter Reyes knows demarcation uh, line. And the, the, I mean, the, I'm talking about Tordesillas. And I have uh, learned the Balios, but he says Balio is the representative of the merchants, not the, not the uh, uh, state. He's not an ambassador, he says, you know. That was, that was uh, very good uh, information. AJ uh, Yüksel uh, gives us uh, good information about the Swayze shipyard. As I told you, as I asked uh, about uh, Swayze shipyard, we know that the area of Hadam Suleiman Pasha's ships has been built in Swayze shipyard. But we don't have enough information, the types of the ships. How Hadam Suleiman Pasha went to India? Which stars he used? What was the uh, logistics? We know that from Venice, just, just, uh, uh, there were some uh, people uh, from different countries as the generals. And, and uh, these things are very important. And also the ships of the uh, a pure race, uh, as you know, he, he made two to, to, to sail to the Hermes uh, and also to uh, Yemen. And uh, the, the, the smuggling, Recep uh, Kürekli, very uh, numerical and informative information he gave us and how Eastern Mediterranean gained importance uh, because of the smuggling. Not only the smuggling of uh, uh, opium or these things, but also uh, international smuggling of human trafficking is very also uh, important. And also he gave us uh, information about Bedouins. These, this is also very interesting because as we know, these Bedouins uh, fit themselves to the uh, uh, conditions of the desert. Uh, they're like sailors, how sailors survive at sea, Bedouins survive at the desert. So they use camels and Bedouins in that area, as I understand. So it was very informative and uh, very numeric uh, presentation. All I want to say is this. So let me uh, let me finish here because it's been a tiring day. So our next uh, next symposium will be on 31st of August, History of Black Sea. If you are interested, uh, where the the call for paper is underway. Our group here in the university is preparing the uh, call for paper. I, I know it's gonna be a very nice uh, uh, symposium, but sorry, it's gonna be online. We have to talk against glass. But after that symposium, if the pandemic ends, so I promise you, we're gonna have good get togetherings in a nice part of the Tur Turkey or somewhere else in Europe or anywhere. So we have good surprises for you. So I would like to thank, starting with our esteemed director and our uh, president of our board of directors, Mr. Tanev Kran, and also our keynote speakers and the speakers and my team, mm -hmm. Kundo and Aydın, and the old technical team, starting with Özgür and the others, really, uh, I'm very, very happy what you have done today. So I say to all of you, 
Goodbye. Take care. Stay away from the pandemic. <laughs> please, please. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Uh, Admiral, may I say a last word also? Uh, in off, in off, we need your foreword as well as the foreword from the esteemed rector and um, Mr. Uh, Tamek Karan for the, the three forwards. Uh, small forwards because there will be three. Uh, we have the introduction is uh, finished and we are only missing one contribution, the editing of one contribution. All the rest is prepared. We still have one or two issues to solve uh, on il illustrations for the editor, you know, because the papers have many tables and some of them have illustrations, but it's going to be ready very soon. So when you will be able to send us the forward, I would be uh, very grateful. And I would like to uh, also thank you all the staff from the university, especially to uh, Funda, who had been really extremely <laughs> helpful in helping us, Professor Philippe Castro in Texas and myself in Paris, to move on forward with the editing of this volume, which we want to be a small but consistent volume of very good scientific quality. Yes. So that's my thank you very okay. much to all of you. So we thank were you. waiting for these small contributions, the forwards. Okay. Uh, the, as I understand, it's going to be a prologue, summary, and forward. Yes. And so, we are prologue, thinking, prologue, we are thinking. Summary, forward. Yes. Is that right? As we did in our first proceedings. Yes. As in the first okay. proceeding. And okay. And we, we will find, uh, I talked to the uh, our esteemed director that yeah. we are going to uh, nominate a publisher. Uh, he, ha he has in mind, uh, we talk, and we'll let you know. Okay. So how, how many pages it's going to be? Do you have an idea? Yeah, we will have around a little bit more than 200. And with the uh, introduction... Oh, Yes, more, more. With illustrations, yeah. with like 200, a little, a little bit less than 300, I guess. Okay, that's good. I like that. So it's going to be a volume. Isn't it? Yes, it's an average volume because, as you know, the editors don't like to publish also the publishers two big volumes. <laughs> so please give my best greetings to Professor Philippe Cascas. Yes, yes, he's uh, working very much on his nautical archaeological base. So okay. Thank you very much. Let's and okay. We keep in touch and let's say goodbye. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Funda. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much to all contributors and Bye. colleagues. Thank you. I guess uh, Admiral Atocho. Uh, I guess uh, as the center, fiscal center, research center, we should make a closing remark. Uh, first, we would like to thank all our participants for their uh, valuable input and their valuable questions from the participants, of course. We would also like to thank you, uh, Admiral Atash, for being with us throughout the phases of all this preparation and presentation. Again, as center, we would like to thank both our keynote speakers for their uh, presence and for their contribution to our symposium. And finally, uh, we want to express our gratitude and special thanks to our rector, Professor Erdogan, and Mr. Tamer Kran, Chairman of Trustees, for their full support and their contributions. We wish you healthy days. Till next time, goodbye. Ms. Songur. Thank you very much, Dr. Shuman Tepe. Okay, as you know, having an online symposium due to, pan uh, due to pandemic problems and limitations is not an easy task. 
as Dr. Shilman Tepe put forward, uh, as the Piri Reis University Maritime History Research Center, we are appreciating a lot to everyone, all academicians who contributed to, to today's discussions. Uh, I would like to remind that each participant will be receiving an attendance certificate through mail and also a regular mail. I also take this opportunity to thank to each personnel in Piriris University who helped us to make this uh, event real, especially directorates of information technology, external relations and organizations, and administrative affairs. We hope to meet again in future uh, events about maritime history. I hereby close the symposium on Eastern Mediterranean maritime history. Thank you very much for your kind attendance and we wish you have a lovely evening.